Hello and welcome to my limited set review for Innistrad Crimson Vow. The plan for this video is to go over every single card in the set and then grade every individual card according to my grading system. All the grades that you see in today's set review will be available in spreadsheet form in case you don't have time to watch the entire thing or maybe want a reference to consult later. So all those ratings will be available to all my patrons and Twitch subscribers and I will keep the spreadsheet updated over time so some of my initial grades could easily be slightly off. So as I play the set more and get more experience I'll be updating the grades so in case you consult a spreadsheet later they will be up to date with uh, all my latest knowledge at least. And to give you an idea how I like to grade my cards I use a letter grade system and to make some comparisons from the previous expansion, starting out at the S tier, which is the highest grade a card can get. These are reserved for ridiculous bombs, cards that can take over a game by themselves and are often pretty difficult for the opponent to answer. Even if they do have a removal spell at the ready, they will still provide a ton of value. Then next up we've got the A grade. These are still bomb level cards, cards you're absolutely ecstatic to open in a pack and first pick. These will often carry a game if unanswered, but they're not necessarily on the S tier level, but still cards that will easily win you a game. Next we've got another example of an A tier card like Brutal Cathar, nice removal spell that can potentially deal with multiple creatures. Then at the B tier we've got great playables, Often the best commons in each color will reach the B grade. These are often the premium removal spells in each color, sometimes great two for one type creatures. Think of Organ Hoarder from Midnight Hunt, definitely falls in that tier. And then of course still cards you're very happy to first pick if there's no bomb level card in the pack. Next up we get to the C plus category. These are above average playables, cards you're still very happy to have in your deck and these will make up the bulk of the cards in your deck if uh, you get lucky at least. So cards like Candlegrove Witch, nice evasive two drop. Cards like Burn the Accursed, so removal spells that might be slightly less efficient than the B tier cards can uh, fall in this category. Sometimes slightly more conditional cards will fall in this category as well. Then next up we get to the C tier. These are still playable cards and a lot of cards in your deck will fall in this category. These are not necessarily exciting cards but uh, you still need to have enough playables to make your deck and sometimes curve considerations also come into effect. If you don't have any two or three drops you might have to take some slightly weaker cards like Shady Traveler to still round out the deck. Also pump spells will often fall in this category for me. Cards that you're usually happy to have in aggressive decks that have a low curve and need some ways to get through for damage, but also not cards you necessarily need to prioritize during the draft. And then we get to the D tier. These are cards you usually don't want to have in your deck. These will get cut more often than not. Sometimes sideboard cards will fall in this category where if you're playing best of one you don't really play these but in a best of three situation you might want to bring this in out of the sideboard. Cards like Thraben Exorcism which is a bit conditional in nature might fall in this category. And then just inefficient cards like the Crossroads Candle Guide. You're pretty unhappy if you have to put this in your deck. And then last but not least there's the F tier. These are completely unplayable cards. There's very few of these in limited nowadays and they're often cards that are meant for constructed play. Cards like Pithing Needle, a very narrow sideboard card for constructed that you shouldn't really have to play in your limited decks. So that concludes my quick introduction about how I rate cards. Next up I like to go over the multicolor cards in a set first as that will give you an idea of what the draft archetypes are all about. And in the case of Crimson Vow, I'll give you a quick overview of all the archetypes. So starting out with Blue White, this is going to be the Spirits and Auras archetype. You'll see a lot of cards with the Disturbed mechanic be in this color pair. And as we'll see when going over the new Disturbed cards, they have a bit of a twist. They're no longer creatures on the backside, but they're Auras instead. Red White is still just about being aggressive, doesn't have a very strong theme, but curving out with creatures, removal spells and combo tricks is still what this color pair is trying to do. Blue Black is the Zombies archetype with a new keyword, Exploit, which we will get to see quite soon here. 
and uh, yeah, still has a little bit of tribal synergy and does kind of what you're used to, play creatures out of the graveyard and try and provide a bit of value. Then black-green is the toughness color pair, so these have a lot of creatures with high toughness and some cards that reward you for having high toughness creatures, maybe some way of dealing damage equal to its toughness, etc. So that's what this color pair tries to accomplish. Red-green, much like Midnight Hunt, is still about werewolves, so you've got your day-night cycle that's coming back alongside a few new werewolves. Then blue-red still cares about casting instants and sorceries, non-creature spells, but this time around, the focus is a little bit more on also maybe including a few more counter spells than before, as a lot of cards that care about casting non-creature spells don't necessarily get a power and toughness bonus, but just deal damage to the opponent for casting non-creature spells, so that might make counter spells go up in value a little bit over the Midnight Hunt blue-red spells archetype. Then black-white cares about life gain, there's a few cards that will reward you for gaining a life and have certain effects trigger, so that's the color pair that cares about that. Then black-red is the vampire color pair, and more specifically it cares about making and sacrificing blood tokens, which we will see soon as well. So these are ways to make use of those artifacts, and uh, yeah, they care about sacrificing the tokens for various benefits. Then green-white is the human archetype, that also makes the most use of the training mechanic, which is a new spin on the mentor mechanic, so cares about creatures attacking and increasing power and toughness. And then blue-green has a similar vibe to the one in Midnight Hunt, which is about self-milling and getting value out of the graveyard. We don't have flashback this time around, but a few other cards that still reward us for putting cards in the graveyard. So this is a quick breakdown of the different color archetypes, and now it's time to take a look at the actual cards. Starting out with Ancient Lumber Knot. This is a 1 for Tree Folk at Uncommon. This is the black green signpost Uncommon, and says each creature you control with toughness greater than its power assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. So this is the card you want to try and draft around and uh, yeah, then just get as many high toughness cards as possible. This gets a B grade, definitely one of the more important cards for black green to have access to. Next up we have Maid of Dishonor, a 4 mana 4-5 four legendary vampire at rare, and when the maid and or one or more other vampires enter the battlefield under your control, we get to create a blood token, and having a look at the blood token here, it's a, an artifact, doesn't have any mana value, and for one mana we can tap, discard a card, and sacrifice this artifact to draw a card. So important to note here, discarding a card is part of the cost, so we can't draw a card if we don't have a card to discard in the first place. And you'll see plenty of cards making these blood tokens, cards that care about controlling them, cards that care about sacrificing them, whether it's using the blood token's own ability or maybe another ability that lets you sacrifice artifacts. So that's what Red Black is all about. And so the Maid of Dishonor's ability triggers only once each turn, and for two mana we can sacrifice another creature or a blood token. So here we see one potential way of sacrificing blood tokens other than their own ability and then each opponent loses to life and you gain to life. So this card is incredibly efficient, for mana 4-5 is already a decent deal. Then we start making a whole bunch of blood tokens, which are not only useful for discarding lands and finding more action in the late game, but as we see here there's other ways we can sacrifice them for value. So Maid of Dishonor gets an A grade, definitely a bomb level card. And next up we have the Blood Tithe Harvester. This is the signpost in common for Red Black. A 2 mana 3 2, that when it enters the battlefield creates a blood token, and we can tap and sacrifice the Harvester, and then target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is twice the number of blood tokens you control, can only be used at sorcery speed. So by itself we'll be able to give something minus 2 minus 2, but if you're Red Black, presumably you have more ways of generating blood tokens. So already a 2 mana 3 2 that makes a blood token is above the curve, would get like a C plus, maybe a B minus, but uh, the ability to take out potentially threatening creatures in the late game I think bumps it up to a solid B uh, card I'm happy to draft pretty early and go red-black. 
Next up is Brian Comer, a 3 mana 1 1 spirit at uncommon. So, this is the signpost uncommon for the blue white spirit disturb archetype. And when this enters a battlefield or becomes the target of an aura spell, we get to create a 1 1 white spirit creature token with flying. So, already entering the battlefield and making a spirit token is pretty good value. A 1 1 flying token is almost worth a card, I would say. And uh, the blue-white archetype has a lot of ways to play auras, even from the graveyard with a new disturb mechanic. So it doesn't take much to generate one or two spirit tokens. And those flying tokens will help you in a racing situation. You can maybe chum block with them as well if needed. So a pretty decent card. And then it disturbs out of the graveyard for just two mana, a blue and a white. In which case it enters the battlefield transformed as an aura. So this enchants one of our creatures. And then when the Brinebound gift enters the battlefield or the enchanted creature becomes the target of an aura spell, we get to make another one of those 1-1 one, one spirit tokens. So the aura is very similar to the creature effect. And yeah, both are great. We get a lot of value from this. And uh, as I've said, blue-white is not going to have a shortage of auras to generate more spirit. So this also gets a B. Next is Child of the Pack, the signpost in common for red-green, which cares about werewolves. And this is a 4-mana 2-5, so pretty reasonable stat. But then for 4-mana we also get an activated ability that creates a 2-2 two -two green wolf creature token. So it can make plenty of tokens on the front half, so this is the daybound side of the card. And then when it transforms to night, we get Savage Packmate instead, a 5-5 Trampler, saying other creatures we control get plus 1 plus 0. Now interestingly, unlike some of the werewolves in Midnight Hunt that usually kept the same ability on the wolf side, this time around we don't have that ability anymore to create wolf tokens, which could actually be a disadvantage. Sometimes you would rather have access to that ability to make more tokens, but instead we get to pump all other creatures, so we can pump up the tokens we made on the daybound side. And then of course a 5-5 Trampler is no joke, so still a very powerful card all around and also gets a B grade. Next is Dorothea, Vengeful Victim. 2 mana for a 4-4 Legendary Creature Spirit at rare. It flies, so there must be a catch, and the catch here is that when Dorothea attacks or blocks, we have to sacrifice it at the end of combat. So we get a very big creature for 2 mana, can play defense well, discourage an attack from the opponent perhaps, or we can get a nice 4 damage attack in, but then we will eventually lose Dorothea. But it also disturbs out of the graveyard, transforming into Dorothea's Retribution, an aura that, if you're familiar with Geist of St. Traft from the original Innistrad, this is very similar. So when the creature attacks, it creates a 4-4 white spirit creature token with flying that's tapped and attacking, and we have to sacrifice that token at the end of combat. So the Retribution is quite powerful. But it is important that we put it hopefully on an evasive creature that has an easier time attacking without the opponent being able to block and take out our creature easily. So finding the right target for retribution is going to be the tricky part. But if it can go unanswered, of course at 4-4 token getting in for 4 damage each turn is going to close out the game very quickly. So overall, I don't think the retribution or Dorothea quite gets to the A grade, just because it's not always going to be straightforward to keep that enchantment going, but definitely still worthy of a B as an efficient creature to play defense well early, and then hopefully that enchantment can help you win the game. Next is Edgar, Charmed Groom, a 4 mana 4-4 four, four legendary vampire noble at rare, saying other vampires you control get plus one plus one, so we get a nice lord, and then when Edgar dies, Return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. And the backside of Edgar is Edgar Mar Markov's Coffin, a legendary artifact saying, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1 1 white and black vampire creature token with lifelink. So that ties into the whole life gain theme in black white. And we put a bloodline counter on the coffin. And then if there are three or more counters on it, we remove those and transform it back into Edgar Charmed Groom. So unless you've got exile-based removal, or maybe a way to destroy the coffin, Edgar's gonna keep on coming back. And those 1-1 one, one lifelinking tokens, of course, will pair very nicely with the plus one plus one that Edgar gives. So overall, a very strong card with a nice recursive effect. Gets an A grade, definitely a bomb. Next is Eruth, 
Tormented Prophet, a 3 mana 2 4 legendary human wizard at rare, saying if you would draw a card, exile the top two cards of your library instead, and you may play those cards this turn. So this also essentially replaces your draw step by exiling the top two cards. So early on in the game, this might be a little bit awkward if you maybe don't have a lot of mana and uh, you know you start exiling expensive cards that you can't cast right away. But it does say you may play those cards, so you can of course still play lands. So yeah, this will essentially double all your card draw effects. And of course this will also be a little bit better in a deck that plays more proactive cards. So it's not that great alongside counter spells, but it is quite good with, you know, burn spell, pump spell type effects. So a deck that wants to be a little bit more aggressive to try and close out the game and be able to make use of all the cards you exile right away, as opposed to keeping cards in hand. But uh, yeah, the card advantage here is going to add up very quickly, so if the opponent can't answer your Tormented Prophet, it's going to run away with the game. So that's a bomb level card right here, gets an A grade. Next is Grolnok, the Omnivore, a 4 mana 3-3 three, three legendary frog at rare, saying whenever a frog you control attacks, mill 3 cards. So blue-green cares about milling cards into your graveyard. And then whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from your library, exile it with a croak counter on it. So lands, creatures, enchantments, those will all get those croak counters on them if we mill them. And then we may play lands and cast spells from among cards we own in exile with croak counters on them. So by itself, Grolnok is not going to have the easiest time attacking and uh, milling more cards. But hopefully we've got other cards in the deck that help us mill more cards into our graveyard to make use of the ability. And then we're essentially, you know, drawing cards as opposed to milling cards, which is quite powerful. So Grolnok is strong, but it only really works in a deck that has other ways of putting cards in our graveyard. Because a 3-3-4-4, three, three, four, four, by the time we can attack with it, the opponent's going to be able to line up some pretty decent blocks. So it is definitely a build-around card but it is powerful, so as an engine card it gets a B grade, just needs a little bit more work to make it as powerful as it can be. Next is Halana and Alina, partners, the 4 mana 2-3 legendary human ranger at rare, has first strike and reach, it's a pretty odd combination, but at the beginning of combat on your turn, put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on another target creature you control, where X is their power, and that creature gains haste until end of turn. So that ability alone is incredibly powerful, even if we're not increasing the partner's power. Getting to put two plus one counters on another creature every beginning of combat, as well as giving that creature haste, it's like a juiced up version of the Stormseeker from Midnight Hunt essentially. So this card seems incredibly strong, and if the opponent can deal with the partners right away, those counters are just going to add up and be insurmountable, so a bomb level card for sure. Next is Kaya, Geist Hunter, the 3 mana Planeswalker, starts out at 3 loyalty, has a plus 1, saying creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn, and then put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on up to 1 target creature token you control. So pretty interesting ability, so it only really works well if we already have some tokens in play, because just giving our team death touch while nice isn't necessarily all that exciting. Then the minus two says until end of turn, if one or more tokens would be created under our control, twice that many of those tokens are created instead. So yet another ability that only works if we have cards that care about tokens. And then the minus six says exile all cards from all graveyards, then create a one one white spirit creature token with flying for each card exiled this way. So Kaya doesn't necessarily convince me. While there may be a few cards in the set that make tokens, I doubt you're consistently going to get a deck that has a lot of token makers available. So that means that the plus one and the minus two are not going to be all that relevant. So then we're just left with a minus six that's potentially powerful. But on the three loyalty planeswalker, the opponent's going to have a pretty easy time killing Kaya before she ever reaches minus six. So I'm giving Kaya a C. It is a Planeswalker. Planeswalkers are, you know, historically still pretty powerful and limited. People tend to make mistakes when trying to attack down Planeswalkers. Maybe 
prioritizing them a little bit too much. But that being said, Kaya's abilities don't really convince me. So I'm gonna say playable under the right circumstances, but I wouldn't be excited to first pick it unless I just want a Mythic Rare for my collection. Next is a Markov Purifier, a 3 mana 2 3 Vampire Cleric at Uncommon. So this is the signpost Uncommon for the Black White Life Gain deck. And as a 2 3 with Life Link, saying at the beginning of your end step, if you gained a life this turn, you may pay 2 generic mana, and if you do draw a card, this certainly rewards you nicely for gaining life. So by itself the purifier is probably not going to have the easiest time attacking and gaining the life necessarily necessary to trigger its ability, but hopefully you've got other ways of gaining life, maybe with an evasive creature or maybe some instant or sorcery that gains life, and then you can start pulling ahead with the purifier's ability. So overall purifier still a pretty powerful card. But it does require a little bit of work, similar to my comments with um, Grolnok, requiring you to have other cards in your deck that mill cards for it to actually be worthwhile. I think I have a similar comment to make about a Purifier, that by itself it doesn't necessarily do much, because a 2-3 life lifelink is just going to get blocked and maybe trades off for an opposing creature, but then the ability is not going to trigger. So it does require you to have other cards in the deck that care about gaining a life. So... Overall, I'm giving Purifier a C+, a powerful build around, but by itself doesn't necessarily make a deck, so uh, that's a C plus grade for me, not a card I would necessarily be excited to first pick. Markov Waltzer is the red-white signpost uncommon 4-mana 1-3 Vampire with Flying and Haste, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, up to two target creatures you control, each get plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So the Waltzer can target itself, but only once, so we cannot give it plus 2 plus 0, but we can give it plus 1 plus 0. So it can potentially attack for 2 with Flying and Haste, so nice evasive threat, as well as potentially pumping something else by 1. So yeah, it's a nice effect, also plays well with the training mechanic, as we'll see later. By increasing a creature's power, it becomes easier to train smaller creatures, and White certainly has a lot of cards with the training ability. So the Waltzer gets a B-grade, powerful evasive creature that has a ton of utility, so doesn't need much help to be good. Next is Odric, Bloodcursed, the 3 mana, 3-3 three, three legendary vampire soldier at rare, very important in the story of Innistrad, but sadly the card's not that exciting. When Odric enters a battlefield we create X blood tokens, where X is the number of abilities among Flying, First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Reach, Trample, Vigilance, found among creatures you control. So we maybe get like one or two blood tokens if we're lucky, and otherwise Odric is just a 3 mana 3-3, three, three, so nothing incredibly exciting. Uh, red White might care about blood tokens a little bit, mostly in red, but it's mostly red-black, that's the color that cares about those blood tokens. But of course we can still use them in the late game to maybe discard some lands and find more action. So nothing wrong with Odric in terms of limited power level, but it's also not necessarily a card that's incredibly exciting. So C+, definitely a card I would uh, play in all my red-white decks, even if I don't have any other extra abilities necessarily. It doesn't take much to make one or two blood tokens. Next is Old Rudstein. A 3 mana, 1 for legendary human peasant at rare. So this is a Golgari card and we can already see that the high toughness theme is also represented at higher rarity. And when this creature enters a battlefield or at the beginning of our upkeep, we mill a card. And if a land card is milled, we get to make a treasure token. If a creature card is milled, we get to make an insect token. And if a non-creature card or non-land card is milled, we get to make a blood token instead. So yeah, this card will generate quite a bit of value over time. I'm guessing most of the time we're either making a treasure or an insect. The blood token probably not gonna happen as much in a black-green deck, which is typically filled with just lands and creatures. So can help us potentially ramp into bigger stuff and then make an army of insect tokens. So decent value card, 
Uh, not necessarily a bomb level card, but certainly worthy of a B grade. And next is Olivia, Crimson Bride, a 6 mana 3 4 legendary vampire noble at Mythic Rare, has Flying and Haste, and when Olivia attacks, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking. And it also gains when we don't control a legendary vampire, we have to exile this creature. So Olivia needs a little bit of setup, but not much. For it to be a great card if we don't have a full graveyard, Olivia is just a 3-4 flyer with haste, which, you know, at 6 mana you would expect a little bit more. But especially if you have some evasive creatures with maybe menace or even death touch, or, you know, just big creatures in general to reanimate, those will be great, because the downside of reanimating a creature that's tapped and attacking is if you bring back a small creature that the opponent can easily block, then Olivia's not necessarily generating a ton of value. But if you can bring back a creature that gets a good attack in and then sticks around, then those are the games where Olivia will shine. So definitely a bomb level card, not quite an S tier, since it does require the right circumstances to be amazing, but definitely a card that will win you a game if unanswered. Next is Runo Stromkirk, a 3 mana 1 4 legendary vampire cleric at rare. In blue black, it flies, and when this creature enters the battlefield, we put up to one target creature card from our graveyard on top of our library. So, pretty interesting ability. And then at the beginning of our upkeep, we look at the top card of our library, and we may reveal that card. If a creature card with mana value 6 or greater is revealed this way, we can transform this. So, ideally, we have an expensive creature in the graveyard that we can put on top of our deck with its ability when it enters, and then in our upkeep it can transform right away. Of course, it's not always going to be that easy but uh, that's where this will be at its best. And then it transforms into a 3-5 flyer, saying whenever this creature attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. And if that creature happens to be a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus or Serpent, we get to make two of those tokens instead. There's not that many Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses or Serpents in the set, so that's more flavor text, but... Uh, a 3-5 flyer that can potentially make a token of another attacking creature certainly powerful. And then a 1-4 flyer for 3 is still pretty reasonable. So a powerful card uh, does require a little bit of build around for you to have creatures with uh, high enough converted mana cost for it to transform. But uh, definitely still a B. Next is Sigardian Paladin, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four Human Knight at Uncommon. So this is green-white, which cares about training, about building up plus one counters, and we also see that reflected here. As long as we've put one or more plus one plus one counters on a creature this turn, the Paladin has Trample and Lifelink. So the way the training mechanic works, as we'll see in a bit, is we can attack, and then by attacking with a training creature and a larger creature, we'll be able to put a plus one plus one counter on the smaller creature. So after attacking, but before damage, the Paladin can potentially gain Trample and Lifelink. And then for three mana, target creature we control with a plus one plus one counter also gains Trample and Lifelink until end of turn. So yeah, that's a lot of power and toughness. Pretty difficult to race for a lot of decks. Trample prevents chum blocking. So the Paladin is perfect for a training heavy deck. And as a four-powered creature, it has a lot of power to enable those training creatures in the first place. So definitely a B-level card at the very least. Quite powerful. Next is Skull Scab, a two-mana 2-2 two -two zombie at Uncommon. So this is the blue-black signpost Uncommon. And blue-black has a pretty big exploit theme. This is a returning mechanic, but for those that aren't familiar with it, when a creature with exploit enters a battlefield, we may sacrifice a creature, and we could technically sacrifice the creature itself, the one that has exploit, and that will still trigger the ability, and in this case the ability says whenever a creature we control exploits a non-token creature, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. So I can't imagine too many scenarios where you would want to sacrifice your own scab 
just to turn it into a 2-2 zombie. So for the most part, we'll want to play the scab, sacrifice something else, maybe some sacrifice fodder type creature, and then start turning those creatures into 2-2 zombies, which can start uh, providing a nice board presence. Now, the opponent can also kill your scab in response to the exploit trigger, then the ability will still potentially resolve, so it does allow you to sacrifice a creature with the exploit ability still happening, but of course if the scab is no longer in play, you're not going to get that 2-2 zombie token, so there's probably no point in sacrificing something unless you've got a, maybe another creature in play that cares about exploiting creatures, just as a side note. So yeah, the Skull Scab, fine card, but it will require a little bit of build around for you to have a lot of uh, sacrifice fodder and creatures you actively want to sacrifice. Exploit isn't a theme that's incredibly well represented after looking at all the cards in the set. There's only a handful of cards, mostly in blue and black, that have the exploit ability. So outside of blue-black, not a theme you're going to encounter very often. But yeah, assuming you can get a few cheap sacrifice creatures and some exploit creatures on top, the scab can definitely provide quite a bit of value over time. So I'm going to give this a C+. Definitely a bit of a build-around card by itself. It's not incredibly impressive, but at the end of the day, it's still a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, so... It's not all that bad. Next is Torrens, Fist of the Angels, a 3-mana 2-2 two -two legendary human cleric at rare in green-white. And this is the first time we're seeing the training mechanic, saying whenever this creature attacks with another creature with a greater power, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So it's a bit of a take on the mentor mechanic that we saw in the previous Ravnica sets. This time around, instead of a larger creature providing the counter, it's a smaller creature that has the ability. So it's almost the reverse of the mentor mechanic, essentially. So, a few notes about training. If a creature with training attacks alongside a larger creature, and the opponent kills the larger creature in response to the training trigger, then the training trigger will still resolve and your creature will still get a plus on counter even if the opponent somehow reduces the power of the larger creature. So let's say the opponent has a removal spell that can give a creature minus three minus three. You attack, the opponent plays it in response to the training trigger, then despite the creature losing its greater power, it is still going to give a counter to the training creature. So once that ability is on the stack, it's basically locked in and you're going to get that counter no matter what. So that's an important difference with the mentor mechanic where shrinking power could potentially mess it up. And then in the case of Torrents, it has some additional abilities here. Whenever we cast a creature spell, we also get to make a 1-1 one, one, green and white human soldier creature token with training. So a 1-1 one, one token, not that impressive, but a 1-1 one, one token with training will easily start picking up more plus one counters. So that makes it a lot better than a regular token would be. Another side note about training, I guess, might as well point it out if you attack with a training creature and then multiple creatures with higher power, you're still only getting a single counter in that attack step, so you won't be able to get more than one counter out of your training trigger in one turn. So yeah, overall Torrents is quite powerful. I think it approaches bomb status as a card you can play early, it will just accumulate a ton of tokens over time if the opponent doesn't remove it. By itself it can start growing and those tokens will also start getting bigger and bigger, so as long as you can pair it with maybe a few pump spells to get those initial attacks in, Torrents will easily dominate a game. Next is a Vile Spawn Spider, 2 mana, 2-3 two, Spider at Uncommon in blue-green, so the color that cares about milling, and it has reach, so already a 2 mana, 2-3 two, reach is a pretty good deal, that's a lot of good stats. Says at the beginning of your upkeep, mill a card, so it will slowly start filling our graveyard. And then for four mana, we can tap and sacrifice a spider to create a 1-1 one, one green insect creature token for each creature card in our graveyard. Can only be used at sorcery speed. So the spider is pretty decent. As I've said already, just a two mana, two, three reach is a good deal. And then it can enable various graveyard synergies. And at some point, if the two, three reach is no longer relevant, maybe you've got like I don't know, five or six creatures in the graveyard, you can turn those into a bunch of 1-1 one -one tokens that can help you close out the game. So that's a lot of value out of a 2-drop, so this gets a B grade. Next is Wandering Mind, 
the signpost uncommon for blue reds, which cares about casting non-creature spells. So a 3-mana 2-1 flyer, not a bad deal, but there's more. When it enters a battlefield, look at the top 6 cards of your library, and you may reveal a non-creature non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. So if your deck has a sufficient amount of non-creature non-land cards, then the Wandering Mind is awesome. A 2-1 flyer that provides a little bit of card selection and card advantage when it comes into play is great. So yeah, all you need to make sure is that your deck has what's a decent number of non-creature spells for Wandering Mind. I would say if you're getting around 10, that's probably a good number to aim for. An awesome card for Blue Red also gets a B grade. And then we're back to the Lumber Knot. So those were all the multicolor cards. A lot fewer multicolor cards in this set compared to Midnight Hunt. So we'll see how that will impact the draft environment. We might see fewer multicolor cards altogether, or we might see the same multicolor cards make more of an appearance than uh, in previous sets which is important for some of these archetypes. Thinking of the Lumber Knot that's in front of us is going to be a very important card for the black-green deck to function. So hopefully people drafting black-green can get a sufficient number of these in their deck. Next up, we'll take a look at white. Starting out with Adamant Will, the two-mana pump spell at common, also reprint from Dominaria, says target creature gets plus two plus two and gains indestructible until end of turn. So very solid combo trick, very happy to have one or two of these in my aggressive training decks that need our creatures to attack to get value. So this is the perfect combo trick in that deck. So in green white specifically, if you don't have enough uh, combo tricks already, you will start valuing Adamant Will quite highly. So you might take it at a slightly higher rate than what I'm giving it here, which is a C. But uh, yeah, still a good card. Next is Angelic Quartermaster, 5 mana, 3-3, three, three, Angel Soldier at Uncommon. Has flying, and when it enters a battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two other target creatures. So this card's pretty awesome. Great again for the green-white training deck that cares about plus one counters and increasing power and toughness. And then a 3-3 three, three flyer for five, not the most efficient rate, but we're getting that next to those plus one counters. So overall, this card gets a B. Arm the Cathars, a 3-mana sorcery at uncommon, saying until end of turn, target creature gets plus 3 plus 3, one gets plus 2 plus 2, and one gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, and then they also gain vigilance until end of turn. So we cannot target the same creature more than once, but ideally we have three creatures in play, so we can get the full plus 6 power and toughness overall. And if we spread those out with maybe a few training creatures in play, we can also get a few extra plus one counters in the process. So definitely a card that wants to pair with training creatures. The overall effect of six additional power and toughness is nice, but of course it's coming at sorcery speed. So the opponent can line up their blocks favorably if they want to. So not necessarily as uh, much of a blowout as it could be at instant speed. But on the other hand, if you want to enable your training creatures, you would be casting your combo trick before attacking anyway, so the opponent can see it coming. So overall, this gets a C, a pretty niche card that only wants to go in the aggressive creature decks and particularly plays well with training cards. Next is Bride's Gown, 2 mana, uncommon equipment artifact. And equipped creature gets plus 2 plus 0 and gets an additional plus 0 plus 2 and first strike as long as an equipment named Groom's Finery is attached to a creature we control and equips for 2 mana. Groom's Finery is an equipment we'll see in black, so it kind of ties together the whole, you know, marriage theme between the uh, two main characters of the set. But if we're just looking at the Bride's Gown, it's kind of a glorified Marauder's Axe. Two mana to play, two to equip, giving two additional power. The chances of also having the Groom's Finery, drawing both and being able to equip both, because it, it's not enough to control the other equipment, it actually has to be attached to a creature you control. So it's very unlikely for all those to come together. So I'm mostly looking at this as a slightly worse Marauder's Axe, because it requires colored mana to play. 
So that's not a great review for a card. Marauder's Axe is a pretty middling card at best, and not many decks are interested. Now it does potentially play well with training creatures by increasing power by two, so it does have that going for it. So it might be slightly better in white than it would be in other colors. But uh, yeah, I'm still not convinced by this. So this would probably get like a, a very low C, high D grade. I'm just gonna give it a D grade out of principle here, just to tell people not to over-evaluate the additional plus O plus 2 in first strike, because it's not gonna happen very often. Next is by invitation only, 5 mana rare sweeper at sorcery speed, saying choose a number between 0 and 13, and then each player sacrifices that many creatures. So for most intents and purposes this will be just a board wipe, kill everything in play, Sometimes, if you control more creatures, you can potentially save one one or two good creatures if you have a few tokens that you can sacrifice instead, and then uh, the opponent might lose their entire board. So it is definitely better than a normal sweeper would be, because you get that additional flexibility, and chances are there's not going to be more than 13 creatures in play. So yeah, this card's definitely a bomb level card. I think I might have slightly undervalued the sweeper in the previous set, so I'm not going to make that same mistake and just give this an A grade. Definitely a bomb. Next is Cemetery Protector, 4 mana, 3-4 Human Soldier at Mythic. It has Flash, and when the Protector enters the battlefield, exile a card from a graveyard. So it can be both our graveyard or the opponent's graveyard. And whenever we play a land or cast a spell, if it shares a card type with the exiled card, we get to make a 1-1 white human creature token. So, very interesting card. So, the best case scenario for Protector is either exiling a land or a creature, but exiling a land is going to be a little tricky, because unless the opponent is actively milling themselves or you're doing so, it's going to be quite hard to find a land in the graveyard. Although I guess there is Evolving Wilds in the set as a reprint, so that's potentially a land that easily ends up in the graveyard. Let's say we don't have a land in the graveyard and we can exile a creature instead, then whenever we play a creature with Protector in play we'll be able to make a 1-1 token. That's a pretty good deal, and it's also a 3-4 flash, so can potentially ambush an opposing creature uh, if the attacks line up well, so it does have that potential as well. And uh, yeah, for 4 mana that seems like a pretty good deal. And as we'll notice, there's going to be one of these cemetery creatures at Mythic Rare in each color, so they all care about exiling a card and then getting a certain benefit when casting something that has the same card type. So that's going to be a recurring theme. Overall, the Protector I don't think quite gets to a bomb status, but it's certainly quite good. So this is like a high B grade, might sneak up to like a B plus if I were handing out B plus, but I'll keep it simple and just give it a B. Next is Circle of Confinement, 2 mana enchantment at uncommon. When it enters battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value 3 or less until the circle leaves. So might be familiar to some people as Baffling End. And then whenever an opponent casts a vampire spell with the same name as a card exiled with the circle, you also gain two life. So very similar to Baffling End, uh, instead of you know getting a 3-3 dinosaur token when answering the enchantments, you just get your creature back. So that could be better, it could be worse. But there's not that many disenchant effects that people should be main decking. So for the most part, two mana and deal with a small creature. And then the additional text of gaining life is not going to come up a whole lot. So yeah, fine removal spell. Uh, doesn't deal with the biggest threats since it only deals with mana value 3 or less. So it doesn't quite get to the B grade because of that, but certainly worthy of a C plus as a very efficient answer. Next is Dawnheart Geist, 2 mana for an uncommon 1-3 Spirit Warlock, saying whenever you cast an enchantment spell you gain 2 life. So this plays well in the blue-white Disturb archetype, where you've got most of the enchantments thanks to Disturb, and uh, yeah, a 1-3 does a reasonable job on defense early, can passively gain life, and blue-white is also a color pair that typically has a lot of flying creatures, which is no different in this set, so very helpful for winning racing situations by gaining a little bit of extra life here and there. 
So yeah, the guy seems like a decent creature, particularly in blue-white. Outside of blue-white, you're not gonna really want this card. So I think I'm just giving this a C, a card that should make it to the people drafting blue-white, but otherwise not a card you should prioritize. Next is Distracting Geist, 3 mana, 2-1 Spirit at Uncommon. And when a Geist attacks, tap target creature defending player controls. So historically this is a very powerful effect to have in an aggressive deck. Think of like the Hammer Skull from the Dinosaur set, or maybe the Star Crowd stack from one of the recent core sets. So a very powerful ability if you can keep up the pressure, curve out, and uh, make it very difficult for the opponent to set up any profitable blocks. Now it does come on a 2-1 body, so even a 1-1 token from the opponent that's left on defense can trade for the Geist. So that's potentially a pretty big drawback, but as long as you can eliminate all blockers from the opponent, this will provide a lot of damage. And then once it does eventually trade, we can also disturb it out of the graveyard. Now it is quite expensive at 5 mana, but we can then enchant any creature we want, and then that creature will have that same ability of being able to tap a creature when it attacks. So if we can put this aura on, let's say, a flying creature, now all of a sudden we can tap an opposing flying creature from the opponent, maybe a reach creature, and make it incredibly difficult to race. So that's perfect for the blue-white disturb archetype. So yeah, I'm liking the Geist quite a bit, and I think overall it gets at least a C+, but I could see this card easily overperform and end up closer to a B. Then we've got Drox Call Infantry, 2 mana for a 2-2 Spirit Soldier at common, so a nice bear, and then it disturbs for 4 mana, and then it turns into an aura, giving the enchanted creature plus 2 plus 2. So this seems awesome for a common, just a fine creature early, can trade off and then turn into a pretty powerful aura. Now, by itself, the aura, of course, I wouldn't be putting a 4 mana enchantment, giving plus 2 plus 2 in my deck, but if it's, you know, incidentally ends up in my graveyard, then it's still an, a nice effect to have access to. So, yeah, very solid common, gets a C+. Estwald Shield Basher is 4 mana for a 4-2 human soldier at common. And when the Shield Basher attacks, we can pay 1 generic mana, and if we do, it gains indestructible until end of turn. So very difficult creature for the opponent to block if we make it indestructible. Not that many creatures with more than 4 toughness in the set, outside of maybe black, green. So yeah, the Shield Basher getting in for 4 repeatedly is great. The, the problem, of course, is that we have to pay the 1 mana up front, so the opponent will know when the Shield Basher is indestructible, it's not like we can use it at instant speed. So the threat of activation is kind of on the controller, we have to pay the 1 up front, and if we have to pay 1 mana every single turn that the Shield Basher attacks, that's gonna start to add up, and that's gonna impact our ability to curve out. So at first glance, Shield Basher looks awesome, but I think once you start playing with it, you're going to realize that that mana is definitely going to add up. Now, on the other hand, let's say you're the opponent, you have a 2-2 creature. Do you keep it back or do you start racing and get in for two? So that's also an interesting question. A pretty tricky card to both play with and against, but I think I'm still ending up on just a C grade. I don't think it quite gets to the C+. Plus. But it does play well with training creatures. As a four-powered creature, it has a lot of stats, so it's going to make it easy to train one of your smaller creatures. My main issue just is that repeated one mana cost is going to start adding up over time. So a fine creature, I would probably play it in most of my white decks, but uh, I don't think quite reaches C+. Next is Faithbound Judge, a 3 mana 4-4 four, four Mythic Rare Spirit Soldier with Defender, Flying and Vigilance. So 3 mana 4-4 four, four, that does a pretty good job on defense early on. And then at the beginning of our upkeep, if a faithful if the Faithbound Judge has two or fewer judgment counters on it, we can put a judgment counter on it. So it will start picking up those counters passively. And then if it has three or more counters on it, it can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So now all of a sudden we're getting in for 4 every turn, 
and thanks to Vigilance still plays defense nicely. So this seems like a pretty strong card, just played on turn 3, opponent can't really attack into it all that easily, and then sooner rather than later it's also going to be a win condition, and then if the opponent does eventually deal with the judge, it can still disturb for 7 mana out of our graveyard, turning into Sinner's Judgment, which enchants a player, and at the beginning of our upkeep put a Judgment counter on the Sinner's Judgment, and then if there are 3 or more Judgment counters on it, Enchanted player loses the game. So an alternate win condition, so of course we want to be enchanting our opponent with the curse. And uh, yeah, I mean, it is slow. Three turns is a lot of time for the opponent to either kill us or potentially find an answer to the enchantment. Yeah, overall, the fact that it is just the backside of an already decent creature gets this at the very least to an A. Not sure if uh, time will tell that this should get an S grade instead, could easily be the case, but I also wouldn't necessarily overvalue the Sinner's Judgment half. The fact that it's pretty expensive to play and then you still need to wait three turns to win the game, that is a lot of time, but will be a nice effect against slower decks that have to answer the 4-4 creature, otherwise they're just gonna die to it, and then the Judgment might be able to get there instead. So very least an A, might be an S, we'll see. Next is Fierce Retribution, which is also the first siding of the cleave mechanic. So this is a 2 mana instant that destroys target attacking creature. So we have to read the entire card, including what's between the square brackets, but we can also cast it for its cleave cost, which in this case is 6 mana. Now keep in mind, if we cast it for its cleave cost, it's still gonna be a card with mana value 2 on the stack, so it doesn't change its mana value, doesn't change its color. Some cards have a cleave cost that's multiple colors, but it will still mean that uh, the card itself is its original color. And uh, yeah, in the case of the cleave, we pay six mana, and then we can ignore all the text that's between the square brackets. So it's just six mana, destroy target creature. So not something you see very often in white, but of course we pay the price for it. Six mana is very expensive. So this card seems decent, gonna be better in a deck with a lot of flying creatures where you're often racing the opponents, they have to attack you back on the ground, and then Retribution is just a nice removal spell, despite your deck being quite aggressive still. In a deck that's trying to attack on the ground and you want to get rid of some blockers, Retribution is gonna be awkward, so definitely pairs better with evasive creatures, but then uh, the cleave for 6 mana is just pure upside. So I think this gets to a C plus, all things told, in the right deck, but uh, just make sure you have the, the right game plan to pair with Retribution. Either you're a controlling deck that can sit back and just kill attacking creatures, or you're like a blue-white flyer deck and you're happy to race the opponent and still use this as an efficient removal spell. And next is Fleeting Spirit, 2 mana for a 3-1 spirit at Uncommon and has the threat of activation here for single white and exiling three cards from our graveyard, the spirit gains first strike until end of turn. So it's important that this isn't ability we have to pay for every time, like we have to with the shield basher for instance. We can simply attack with the spirit and then hopefully we already have three cards in our graveyard and then the opponent faces the decision like if they, let's say, have a 2-2 creature on defense, do I block and make the opponent give it first strike for one mana? Or do I just take three, which is usually going to be the outcome, and then you didn't ha even have to use the ability, but you still get to attack past an opposing blocker. So that's the power of threat of activation and these activated abilities. Now, exiling three cards from your graveyard, not going to be trivial, so probably only going to be something you can activate later in the game. But, you know, early on it's still a 3-1, so still a fine card. And then you can also discard a card from your hand, which also happens to fuel the first ability. And then we can essentially flicker our Fleeting Spirit, so we exile it and return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So we can save it from removal, for instance. So, overall, a reasonable card. Don't think we're going to be 
using the discard a card ability very often, even though there are a few cards in the set that specifically care about discarding cards, so it can potentially enable some synergies, but there's not very many of those. Um, can also function as like a discard outlet for maybe a re reanimation effect, but also maybe only one or two reanimation cards in the entire set. So mostly just a nice aggressive creature with some good late game utility, but uh, has some combo potential as well. So overall, decent package, gets a C+, fine to drop. Then we have Griff Rider, 3 mana, 2-1 Human Knight at common. It flies, and it also has training, saying when this creature attacks with another creature with greater power, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So not too difficult to get the first counter on the rider. If we have a random three-powered creature, can maybe attack and trade on the ground while the griff rider gets an extra counter, and then will permanently be a three-powered flyer. That's a pretty good deal. So I think the griff rider gets a C+, just a decent evasive creature, and uh, yeah, if we have something like a shield basher on the ground, that also pairs well with a rider being able to get this to four power eventually. That seems like a great combo. Then we have Griffwing Cavalry, very similar to our previous card. This is a four mana uncommon human knight. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It flies, has training, and when the cavalry attacks, we can pay one and a white, and if we do, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until end of turn. So this type of effect is something we've seen in the past. Cards like the uh, Pegasus Corsair come to mind. Now here we do have to pay two mana for something to get flying. But the fact that it also has training is quite awesome since that means we can easily keep growing the cavalry if we have like a three or four powered creature. We can keep growing the cavalry and uh, the damage is going to start piling up pretty quickly. And if we have some large green creature maybe, then uh, being able to fly over and ignore all blockers is very powerful indeed. So I think the cavalry is worthy of a B. Next is Hallowed Haunting, 4 mana enchantment at Mythic Rare. It says as long as you control 7 or more enchantments, creatures you control have Fly and Vigilance. That's probably never going to happen. And then whenever we cast an enchantment spell, create a white Spirit Cleric creature token, saying this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of spirits you control. Now blue-white does have a decent number of spirits, so naturally you might already control a couple spirits and of course casting an enchantment spell is going to be quite common with the disturb mechanic casting those auras from the graveyard now that being said i'm still not incredibly impressed by the hallowed haunting it doesn't do anything the turn you play it it's only gonna slowly start making tokens if you have enough enchantments so it's very conditional very slow and overall, I don't think it's quite going to be good enough. Feels more like a constructed build around than a limited card. So I'm going to give this a D, but I could see some very niche decks with a very high density of enchantments that can make use of it. Next is Heron of Hope, 4 mana for a 2-3 bird at common. It flies, says if we would gain life, gain that much life plus 1 instead. And for 2 mana it gains lifelink until end of turn. So this is reminiscent of the Pegasus from Theros that could also gain lifelink. So the Heron seems pretty decent, uh, especially in the context of the black-white life gain deck. There's a couple cards there that uh, care about gaining life, and the Heron can essentially gain 3 life by itself. So also makes it quite difficult to race if you've got the spare mana to use the ability. So Heron seems quite solid. The extra point of toughness also useful for blocking opposing flyers. So I think overall gets a C+. Next is Heron Blast Geist. 5 mana for a 3-3 spirit at common. It flies, and for 4 mana we can exile the Geist from our graveyard to create two 1-1 one -one white spirit creature tokens with flying. Can only activate this if we control an enchantment and only at sorcery speed. So 5 mana 3-3 three, three flyer, not an exciting rate. The ability to make 1-1 one, one tokens is nice, but it's also conditional. You're not always going to have an enchantment. 
So overall, I'm not really sold on the Blastgeist here, so I'm probably going to fall closer to a C than a C+. But uh, under the right circumstances, those extra tokens will certainly save the day. So I'm going to give this a C, but uh, in the blue-white enchantment deck, this might go up in value slightly. Hopeful Initiate is a 1-mana rare human warlock. It's a 1-2, and it has training. So training on a 1-drop means it's going to be pretty easy to start putting extra counters on it. If we just curve Initiate in a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, this could quickly become a 2-3, which is not a bad deal for 1-mana. And, that, and then for 2 and a white, we can remove 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters from among creatures we control to destroy target artifact or enchantment. So just pure upside on a 1 mana training creature. I'm not going wild about this. If you draw it late game, it's going to have a pretty difficult time getting additional plus 1 counters. But assuming you can play it early, it's certainly a fine creature to curve out with. So it gets a C, playable, but not necessarily a very high pick. Then we have Catilda, Dawnheart Martyr, returns from uh, Midnight Hunt, but this time in spirit form. So it's a 3 mana, star star, legendary spirit warlock, and Catilda's power and toughness are each equal to the number of permanents you control that are spirits and or enchantments. So by itself Catilda's a spirit, so it can be a 1-1 one, one essentially if you play it by itself. And then it also has Flying, Lifelink, and Protection from Vampires. Protection from Vampires certainly relevant in a set that's uh, filled to the brim with Vampires, especially in red-black. So already just a 1-1 one, one Flying Lifelink with Protection from Vampires could be a playable card in this set. And then it doesn't take much to control a few spirits or enchantments, especially in blue-white. And then Catilda's going to be incredibly difficult to race. And then if the opponent does eventually kill Catilda, it also has Disturb. And that's going to be 5 mana to essentially get the enchantment form of Catilda. So the enchanted creature has Flying, Lifelink, Protection from Vampires, and plus X plus X, where X is the number of permanents you control that are spirits and or enchantments. So yeah, this card seems pretty awesome overall. And it's going to be very difficult to race if you can put this on any creature pretty much, since it automatically gains flying, so it will have evasion and uh, will gain additional life as well. So I'm going to go with somewhere between an A bomb level and a B. It is certainly a build around, like if it's just plus one plus one and all those abilities, it's still okay, but not incredible. So ideally you want to play this in a deck with a couple spirits and uh, other enchantments. So I think that makes me go closer to a B than an A, just because it still requires a bit of build around. But uh, I would still easily play this in a deck without many enchantments or spirits, just for the plus one plus one essentially. So B for Catilda. And then we have Kindly Ancestor, 3 mana for a 2-3 spirit at common with a lifelink, disturbs for 2 mana, and then the enchanted creature has lifelink. Fine card, gets a C. It's going to be better alongside flying creatures, again being able to give an evasive creature lifelink. It's going to make racing very difficult for the opponent. And then Lantern Flare is another cleave card. This one's a little special because the normal card is 2 mana and it's just a white card. But the cleave cost is X, a red and a white. If we first read Lantern Flare the way it functions without cleave, it deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker and we gain X life, where X is the number of creatures we control. So what's like a normal scenario? We maybe control two or three creatures, we're in like a racing situation, and then all of a sudden we can start uh, killing an opposing creature with two or three toughness and gain a bunch of life in the process. That's not a, a bad deal. But then with Cleave, which does require red mana, so it's not going to go in every deck, this card does become quite a lot more exciting, as we can deal X damage to target creature or planeswalker, and we gain X life full stop. So if we have, let's say, 6 or 7 mana, can deal 4 or 5 damage to a creature or planeswalker, and it doesn't matter how many creatures we control, 
And uh, yeah, that's going to be a nice swing in life totals and potentially going to help us win a racing situation, which Red White, being kind of the aggressive color pair, is certainly interested in. So overall, Lantern Flare, decent card. Um, I think both halves are playable, but of course we'll get quite a bit more exciting if you're Red White to get access to the Cleave. So C+, plus at the very least, I could see this overperform and probably sneak into the B range, but I'll start out with conservative C+. Plus. Next up is Militia Rallier, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three common. Cannot attack alone, but it can still block alone at least. And then when the Rallier attacks, untap target creature. Reasonable card, uh, might play well in the training deck as just a 3-powered creature to grow some of your 1- and 2-powered creatures out there. And uh, a 3-3 that can still block is just a fine curve filler. So probably just a C, solid playable, but wouldn't necessarily go up to a C plus for this. Then we've got a Nebelgast Beguiler, 5 mana, 2-5 spirit at common. And then it has a decent activated ability, where we can pay a white mana tap it to tap target creature. Now, I have a few issues with this card. Normally tappers are good because they're pretty cheap, and then you can of course use the activated ability, and uh, you don't necessarily care about blocking with your tapper creature, because, you know, it's going to be tapping an attacker, so it's not going to be able to block in the first place. Now instead, we're paying 5 mana for a 2-5, which is not particularly efficient, so... We only really care about this creature for the ability, but instead we're overpaying to get a pretty mediocre 2-5. So I guess a scenario where this card could be okay is instead of tapping an attacker from the opponent, it's a 2-5 that can block, and then end of turn you can still maybe tap a blocker from the opponent to keep up the pressure. So that's maybe the scenario where this card's okay. But uh, I still feel kind of offended that we're overpaying for a tapper which should typically be a lot cheaper than this. So, out of principle, I think I'm going to give this a D, but, uh, you know, the ability is certainly powerful, it's just a little bit too overcosted. Next is Nurturing Presence, 2 mana, Enchantment Aura at common, and then the enchanted creature gets the ability whenever a creature enters a battlefield under our control, this creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So that alone would not make this a playable card, but there's more. When the presence enters a battlefield, create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. So that I like a little bit more. It essentially makes a creature right away, assuming the opponent doesn't kill our creature in response. So probably only want to play this if the opponent stepped out. And then we get a 1-1 spirit, which as I've said earlier, is almost worth an entire card. Not quite, but... It certainly approaches one, and uh, of course in the Spirit Aura deck that has a lot of cards that care about controlling and casting auras and enchantments, this goes up in value, and then the turn we play the presence, we trigger the ability, so the creature we enchant immediately gets plus one plus one. Yeah, I think this card's playable, but probably just a C, nothing more. Next is Ollenbock Escort, 1 mana for a 1-1 one, one Human Cleric at Uncommon, has Vigilance, and we can also sacrifice it at any point, and then target creature we control with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it gains a lifelink, and indestructible until end of turn. So this should pair well with training creatures that automatically pick up plus 1 plus 1 counters, but it's still just a 1 mana 1-1 one, one Vigilance, so it's unlikely to get much damage in by itself. So it's kind of this weird comma trick that's visible in play, so the opponent can easily play around it. So not a fan of the escort, gets a D. Next is Panicked Bystander, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Human Peasant at Uncommon. And whenever the bystander or another creature we control dies, we gain 1 life. And at the beginning of our end step, if we gained 3 or more life this turn, transform the bystander. This card is of course going to be at its best in the black-white life gain archetype, and we've already seen one way that we can easily gain 3 life with that 2-3 uh, flyer that can gain lifelink, gains one additional life, so that can gain 3 in one turn, 
and transform the bystander. Getting three life to transform the bystander just from creatures dying is unlikely to happen, so we do need additional ways to gain life for this to transform. But at the end of the day it's still a 2 mana 2-2 two -two, which is fine, that passively maybe gains a few points of life. So that's already uh, above the curve for a 2-drop. And then if it does transform we get a nice 3-5 saying whenever the culprit or another creature we control dies we also gain one life and for 2 mana the culprit gains death touch until end of turn. So a very powerful card all around I would say and uh, at the very least worthy of a C+. Plus but might sneak its way into the B category. The main issue I have with it is transforming is not going to be as easy as it sounds, because while there are a few cards that care about gaining life and that can help you get to 3 life in one turn, it's by no means going to be trivial. I feel like, just looking at the entire set, while there's a few lifelink creatures out there, they're usually 2 powered, so you're going to need a little bit more help to get to that 3 life gain in one turn, so otherwise uh, this might get a higher grade. Then we have Parish Blade Trainee, 2 mana for a 1-2 human soldier at common, with training, so the classic keyword that we're going to see a lot in white especially. And when a trainee dies, put all its counters on a target creature you control. So 2 mana, 1-2 with training is not amazing, but probably still playable. So let's say we play this on turn 2, turn 3 we play some random 3-powered creature, then on turn 4 we can maybe start attacking with a trainee and grow it up to a 2-3. Still probably gonna run into some awkward blocks from the opponent, so it probably has to be backed up by a pump spell as well to really get going. But then once we do get a 2-2 power, then the turn after it will probably get to 3 power pretty easily and it can start to snowball. So by itself not a very good card. But under the right circumstances, with enough high-powered creatures and pump spells to back it up, it will get there. So overall I'm not necessarily sold on the trainee, I'm gonna start out with a D, but in a training heavy deck with enough pump spells I could see this making the deck and being a fine card. Next is Piercing Light, 1 mana instant, deals 2 damage to target attacking or blocking creature, and you also get to scry 1. I believe Slash of Talents was a very similar card in a previous set. Wasn't very good back then. Uh, does this get a little bit better because of the set mechanics? I guess you could maybe kill like a training creature in response to it getting a plus one counter when it's still small. So maybe that makes it a little bit better than Slash of Talents was in its set. Maybe creatures are in general a bit smaller than they are in uh, the set where Slash of Talents was printed but overall still not very high on Piercing Light. I think I'm closer to a D than a C on this. Definitely much worse than the 2-mana removal spell we've seen. Next up is Radiant Grace, 1-mana Enchantment Aura at Uncommon, enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature gets plus 1 plus 0 and has Vigilance. So by itself that's not incredible. But when the enchanted creature dies, we return Radiant Grace to the battlefield transformed under your control attached to target opponent, and then it's going to be a curse enchanting the opponent, and creatures enchanted player controls enter the battlefield tapped. So pretty annoying effect if you're the opponent. That being said, it's not necessarily like game ending, just makes it a little bit more difficult to get your early blocks in. So this might be okay in like a very aggressive red-white deck or maybe a green-white training deck where the extra power can also enable training in the first place. I wouldn't necessarily overvalue the curse by itself because it does take a little bit of work to eventually get it. If the opponent has like a bounce spell then that also potentially gets around the uh, creature dying and you're not going to get your curse or if the opponent can exile the creature, so that also gets around it. Overall, it gets a C, playable, but uh, not particularly exciting. Then we have the Resistance Squad, 3 mana for a 3-2 human soldier at Uncommon, and when the squad enters the battlefield, if you control another human, draw a card. So this will be at its best in green-white, which has the highest density of humans, and the 3-mana three 3-2 three that draws a card seems pretty awesome. 
If you don't have a human in play, then this is pretty mediocre. But uh, yeah, hopefully you drafted a good deck with enough two mana humans and this can reliably draw a card, in which case this is easily a C plus. And then we have Sanctify, two mana sorcery at common, destroys target artifact or enchantment and you gain three life. Don't think there's enough of an incentive to main deck this, so this will be a pretty niche sideboard card. So a D at best. And then Savior of Allenbok, 3 mana Mythic Rare, 1-2 Human Soldier with Training. And whenever the Savior trains, which means if the training ability puts a plus 1 counter on it, we can exile up to 1 author target creature from the battlefield or creature card from a graveyard. And when the Savior leaves the battlefield, put the exiled cards onto the battlefield under their owner's control. So the Savior's pretty interesting and I only now realize its full potential. So the obvious way to use Savior is you attack, train this and remove an opposing blocker from the opponent. And uh, you might be able to get rid of one or two creatures from the opponent. But then when they eventually find a removal spell for the Savior, they get all their creatures back. But another way we can use Savior is by exiling our own creatures from our graveyard. And then if the savior dies, maybe dies right away, maybe dies in a few turns, then we can essentially reanimate the uh, creatures that we exiled with the savior and they go straight onto the battlefield. So the savior has quite a bit of utility with that uh, additional angle as well. So I think that might actually bump it up to an A, whereas before uh, considering the reanimation angle, I was closer to a B on savior as kind of an awkward version of the uh, same three mana removal creature from Midnight Hunt, the uh, Cathar. So yeah, I think Savior might push up to an A thanks to that cute interaction with the graveyard. Next is Sigarda's Imprisonment, a three mana enchantment aura enchanting a creature and the enchanted creature can't attack or block. So a pretty classic effect that we've seen many times before in the version of like Luminous Bonds. And then for 5 mana we can exile the enchanted creature and create a blood token as well. Even if it didn't have that extra 5 mana ability this would be a very solid card, but this is pure upside, makes it so the opponent can sacrifice their creatures for value or potentially deal with your enchantment to free their creature. And then that blood token, once you're at 5 mana, it probably means you don't want to be playing additional lands out, so that blood token can maybe help you loot away additional lands you don't need. And uh, white doesn't get access to a ton of blood tokens, so this is a pretty unique effect in uh, that respect as well. So Imprisonment gets a B, probably the best white common if I had to guess. Next is Sigardos Summons. Six mana enchantment at rare, saying creatures you control with plus one plus one counters on them, have base, power and toughness 4-4, four, four, have flying and are angels in addition to their other types. So this card is pretty tough to evaluate. Of course the obvious application of this is in a deck full of training creatures where you can maybe attack with them and the same turn you attack with them they'll get their counters and transform into these 4-4 four, four angels with additional counters on them and the opponent won't be able to block even if your initial training creature was pretty weak. So Sigarda Summons has the potential of just, you know, ending the game on the spot the turn you play it, or at the very least the turn after, but it is pretty conditional in nature. Six mana is expensive, especially for an aggressive training deck that's probably more interested in being a, a low curve deck that uh, doesn't want to get to six mana. And then if you don't have any training creatures or plus one counters in the first place, this just doesn't do anything. So it could just be six mana that doesn't impact the board at all. So a high variance card, the dedicated training decks might be able to make good use of it, but I'm still a little bit skeptical overall. So I'm going to land on a C for Sigarda Summons, but hopefully uh, this will be a nice finisher for those training decks. And then we have Supernatural Rescue for mana enchantment aura. It has flash as long as you control a spirit, which, you know, blue and white especially have a decent number of. 
and when we cast it, we can tap up to two target creatures we don't control, and then it enchants a creature we control, giving it plus one plus two. So if we play this at instant speed, we're probably playing this before attackers are declared, so we can tap two attackers from the opponent, but then the plus one plus two the opponent will know about, so it's not going to ambush anything. We could also just play it in our turn to get rid of two blockers, maybe a nice way to enable your training creature to attack. So it does have that utility as well, but it is expensive at 4 mana, and uh, it is a little bit awkward that we can't, you know, maximize tapping two creatures and ambushing a creature at the same time if we want to flash this in. Yeah, I don't think this card's amazing, but I can recognize its utility, especially in a training deck. So overall, where does the rescue land? I think it's closer to a D than a C. But uh, maybe one of these as a curve topper in an aggressive training deck could be okay. And then we've got a reprint of Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, 2 mana, 2 1, a legendary human soldier at rare, first strike, and says non creature spells cost 1 generic mana and more to cast. So this is a symmetrical effect, impacts both you and the opponent. Although, presumably, if you're like a white creature deck, you're less likely to have a lot of non creature spells in the deck compared to your opponent, so it's more likely to hurt the opponent than it will hurt you. Still, at the end of the day, mostly seeing this as a 2-mana two 2-1 two with first strike, which is above average, so uh, gets a C+. Then we have Traveling Minister, 1-mana for a 1-1 one -one human cleric at common, can tap to give target creature plus 1 plus 0 so until end of turn, and we also gain 1 life but we can only activate as a sorcery. So it's not going to catch the opponent by surprise, but it is a neat little way to get some incremental life gain, so it will play well in the black-white life gain archetype, as well as increasing power, which will be useful for the training archetype. So it is a card that will fit into multiple decks, probably just a C. We've got the Twin Blade Geist, which is a 2 mana 1 1 double striking Spirit Warrior at Uncommon. And it also has Disturb for 2 and a white. And you guessed it, Enchanted Creature has Double Strike. So, pretty decent card overall. 2 mana 1 1 double strike is uh, certainly above average for a 2 drop. Plays well with any additional auras or other pump spells we might put on it. And then the Disturb is even more value, Double Strike. A very powerful effect when paired with some high-powered creatures or evasive creatures. So, at the very least, a C plus um, might sneak its way up to a B, but uh, I'm gonna start out with C plus for the Twin Blade. And then we have the Unholy Officiant, 1 mana, 1 2, Vampire Cleric at common with Vigilance. And for 5 mana, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. A little bit too pricey for my liking, so I'll give this a D. Don't think this is going to make your deck very often. And then Valor Stands, 2 mana instant at uncommon, can either destroy a creature with toughness 4 or greater, which is the more exciting use of it, or we can give a creature indestructible until end of turn. So it has some nice utility, either as a removal spell or this uh, pseudo compound trick. So yeah, definitely a nice flexible card. Uh, still a little bit conditional in nature, despite the flexibility. It's not always going to be uh, as easy to get a full card's value out of it, but I think it still lands on a C+. And then Vampire Slayer is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two human soldier at common. And when the Slayer deals damage to a vampire, destroy that creature. So can potentially punish the red-black strategies. Although, that being said, most vampires that are more expensive typically have flying. And the smaller ones would probably trade for the Vampire Slayer anyway. So I don't think the ability is going to be incredibly impactful. But still a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with slight upside. So gets a C. And then Voice of the Blessed is a 2-mana, two 2-2 two -two Spirit Cleric at rare, saying whenever we gain life, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the voice, and as long as a voice has 4 or more counters on it, it also has Flying and Vigilance. So it doesn't take too much work to get this 
up to a flyer, especially if we have cards like the Traveling Minister that can gain one life every turn without having to attack. So those are the types of cards you want to pair with a voice. And yeah, once it gets four or more counters, it turns into a real threat. And then if you somehow get to ten or more counters, it also has indestructible. I don't think that's going to come up very often. But uh, yeah, potentially a lot of value out of a two drop. Not the easiest to cast on curve necessarily. But in a dedicated black-white life game deck, I think this is going to be a pretty strong creature overall. So we'll give this a B, a bit of a build around, but uh, you can certainly get a lot of uh, work done with it under the right circumstances. And then we have Wedding Announcement, a 3 mana enchantment at rare, saying at the beginning of your end step, put an invitation counter on the announcement. If you attacked with two or more creatures this turn, draw a card. That sounds pretty fun. Otherwise, we get to make a 1-1 human creature token instead. So we either draw a card or make a 1-1 token. And then if the announcement has three or more invitation counters on it, transform it. So after three turns, it will eventually transform. And then we get the wedding festivity and enchantment giving creatures we control plus one plus one. So, pretty neat card. If we already have creatures that are attacking, we get to draw cards, and presumably we already have a bit of a board presence, so eventually the plus one plus one to the team will be useful. And if we didn't have any board presence going, then at the very least we'll have a few 1-1 one -one tokens to pump up with the enchantment. So, both modes are decent, and for three mana this seems like a pretty good deal. So I think I'm liking a B for the wedding announcement. And then last but not least, Welcoming Vampire, a 3 mana 2-3 vampire at rare with flying, saying whenever one or more other creatures with power 2 or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. This card seems insane, doesn't take much to essentially draw a card every turn, maybe every other turn, and it's still a 2-3 flyer for 3, so very decent stats. This seems like a bomb, and easily gets an A. First blue card, Alchemist's Retrieval. 1 mana instant at common, returning target to non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand, but it also has Cleave for 1 and a blue. Of course, with Cleave the mana value is still going to be 1, of the cards could be potentially relevant, and then we can return any non land permanent to its owner's hand. So it's almost like casting retrieval for one mana is more of its reminder text over the default two mana cleave version. So it just kind of reminds people that you can indeed bounce your own permanence sometimes, which uh, is not going to come up very often, but yeah, you can basically evaluate this as a two mana bounce spell with slight upside if you target your own stuff, in which case it's going to be a little bit cheaper. So fine card gets a C grade, a pretty normal effect to have in blue, and some decks will be happy to have like one or two of those. Next is Binding Geist, a 3 mana, 3-1 three spirit at common, and when the Binding Geist attacks, target creature and opponent controls gets minus 2 minus 0 until end of turn. So a 3-1 can shrink down opposing creatures, can maybe allow it to get a couple profitable attacks in, but it only shrinks by two power and it only has one toughness, so it's still going to be pretty easy for the opponent to eventually trade for the Geist. But then again, at three power, it's often going to be a trade at the very least, so it's not like the opponent's going to be able to kill this for free. And then once it does eventually die, we can also disturb it for two mana, in which case it turns into an enchantment aura, and unlike most of the other auras that we want to put on our own creatures, this is actually a removal spell type effect that will enchant an opposing creature, giving it minus 2, minus 0. So overall, this card seems pretty decent. The fact that it has that disturb effect also means it's a pretty good card to have in like the blue-green self-mill archetype, where you might not have a lot of interest in casting the Binding guys, but if you randomly put the guys in the graveyard, you can still get access to the Disturb half of the card. So overall makes for a decent package, I think, so it gets a C+. 
Next up is Bioloom Egg. A 3 mana 04 Serpent Egg at Uncommon. Has Defender, and when the Egg enters the battlefield, we get to Scry 2. And when we sacrifice Bioloom Egg, return it to the battlefield transformed under Sonar's control at the beginning of the next end step. And the transformed half is the Bioloom Serpent, a 4 4, that can also sacrifice two islands, so it cannot be blocked this turn. So the obvious synergy with Bioloom Egg is alongside exploit creatures. So we can play the egg, and then maybe a few turns later we play an exploit creature, sacrifice the egg, and then we get a 4-4. Four, four. So all in all, we got a 3-mana 4-4 four, four on a bit of a delay that also got to scry 2 when it entered the battlefield. And then the serpent can maybe help us close out the game if we need to deal those last 4 points of damage. So yeah, decent card in an exploit deck. If you have no way of sacrificing the egg, then I'm not really interested. So it's going to be a bit of a synergy card, but uh, assuming you're in blue, it shouldn't be too difficult to pick up a few exploit creatures. So I'll give this a B. I think it has quite a bit of value if you can uh, make it work. Next is Cemetery Illuminator, part of the Cemetery Cycle at Mythic Rare. So 3 mana, 2, 3, Spirit with flying. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, exile a card from a graveyard. And we may look at the top card of our library at any time, and once each turn we can cast a spell from the top of our library if it shares a card type with a card exiled with the Illuminator. So it does say we may cast a spell, so we cannot play lands with the Illuminator, uh, which is an important distinction. So what are we most interested in... Uh, Casting with Illuminator, of course, creatures. Creatures often end up in a graveyard, so it's not going to be too difficult to get good value out of it. And at the same time, it's a 3-mana 2-3 flyer, which is not too bad by itself. So yeah, there's a lot to like about the Illuminator. Certainly feels like a bomb-level card that will provide an insurmountable amount of card advantage if it goes unanswered, but a 2-3 is not the most difficult creature to kill. Chill of the Grave, a 3-mana instant at common, costs 1 less to cast if you control a zombie. And then we can tap target creature, doesn't untap during its next controller's untap step, and we get to draw a card. So pretty nice tempo play, will go nicely with uh, like an aggressive flyer's deck that wants to race. This will buy a lot of time. And then zombie means blue-black is going to have the highest density of zombies as we know by now. So fine card, gets a C. Then we have Cobbled Lancer, a 1 mana 3-3 three, three zombie horse at Uncommon. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to exile a creature card from our graveyard. So not a card we're easily going to play on turn 1, but it will be a nice cheap creature to play in later turns to help us double spell. And then for 4 mana we can also exile the Lancer from our graveyard to draw a card. So we'll randomly provide some value if we happen to mill it or if it died. So pretty decent card overall, but it does require a little bit of work to get it in play early. We'll be at its best in the blue-green self-mill archetype and in the blue-black zombies deck. So overall, where do I land on the Cobbled Lancer? I think it's probably closer to a C plus than a B, just because it's not going to be trivial to get it out there. But once you do, it's going to be a pretty nice card. Next is Consuming Tide. This card's a, a mouthful. 4 mana sorcery at rare. Says each player chooses a non-land permanent they control. So that's typically going to be their most expensive card. And then return all non-land permanents not chosen this way to their owner's hands. If the opponent has more cards in hands than we do, we also get to draw a card. So, pretty weird card. It's symmetrical, but presumably if you're the one casting it, you've got the better circumstances going for you. Maybe you only have one creature in play to begin with, and you can bounce a bunch of tokens and other small creatures from the opponent. So, there's definitely circumstances where this can be very impactful, but there will also be situations where it doesn't deal with the biggest problem on the board, and after casting this, you'll still be pretty far behind, so it didn't really accomplish all that much. 
So I'm not super high on Consuming Tide, just gonna give it a C. The effect is powerful, but it's not always gonna have the desired outcome, so can't give it too high of a grade. Next is Cradle of Safety, 2 mana enchantment aura at common, has flash, enchants a creature you control, and when the cradle enters the battlefield, enchanted creature gains hexproof until end of turn, and also gives it plus one plus one. So pretty nice uh, effect, especially in the blue-white auras deck that might want to put a couple enchantments on the same creature, making it a high value target for opposing removal spells, and then the cradle can uh, save that creature from at least one removal spell, as well as potentially enabling some aura synergies and giving plus one plus one. So I'm gonna give cradle a C, just a fine kind of comma trick and way to save a creature, but gonna be at its best in the aura strategies. Cruel Witness is a 4-mana 3-3 bird horror at common. It flies and says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, look at the top card of your library and you may put that card into your graveyard. So basically surveil. So 4-mana 3-3 flyer is decent, not amazing. Uh, we're used to 4-mana 3-3 flyers by now, so it's not uh, necessarily the best stats out there but it's certainly playable. And then casting non-creature spells, it is gonna happen, but most decks only have so many non-creature spells to cast in the first place. So this will be at its best in like a blue-red spells matters deck, where you're gonna have the highest density of non-creature spells. So in that deck, it will probably be closer to a C+. Outside of it, it's still fine. Flyers win games of limited, but... Uh, you know, it's not not a card I would necessarily be super hyped to take early. So I'm landing somewhere between a C and a C plus. Might actually still be closer to a C plus since flyers are still quite valuable and limited, as we all know. So I'll land on C plus for Cruel Witness. Next is a Diver Scab, a five mana, three five zombie at uncommon has exploit. And when the diver exploits a creature, target creature's owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library. So very powerful exploitability, assuming you have some creatures to sacrifice. As we mentioned earlier with uh, exploits, we can also sacrifice a scab itself with its exploitability. Although typically don't want to spend five mana to get this effect at sorcery speed. So hopefully we've got some cheaper creatures to get rid of instead and keep the 3-5 around. So a decent effect, especially good at punishing those aura strategies, as um, we can bounce a creature with a bunch of enchantments on it. And uh, yeah, not sure what more I can say. Plays well with the Bioloom Egg we saw earlier. A uh, decent card, but does require a little bit of work to get that exploit going. Not every deck has a ton of creatures that can readily sacrifice, so going to be at its best in like blue-black, which has, especially at common, a few black creatures that you don't mind sacrificing. Next is Dreadlight Monstrosity, a 6-mana Crab Horror at common. It's a 5-5, and it also has a Ward 2, so Ward makes a comeback, and whenever this creature becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, we can counter it unless the opponent pays that 2 generic mana cost. And then for 5 mana, the monstrosity can't be blocked this turn, can only activate it if you own a card in exile. So pretty weird requirements, um, but there are a decent number of cards in the set that let you exile cards, so it's not going to be impossible, especially in like a, a blue-green deck I imagine that has ways to ramp into the monstrosity and then cares about putting cards in the graveyard and exiling them. That's probably going to be the best home for the monstrosity. And then it's nice to have a bit of built-in protection, so the opponent at least has to pay the extra mana to get rid of it. And a 5-5 is pretty large in this set. While black-green has some high-toughness creatures, there's not that many high-powered creatures that have both high power and toughness, maybe outside of like red-green with the werewolves that tend to be a little bit bigger. So overall, I think still a C for monstrosity. It is expensive, 
but assuming you can eventually make it unblockable, it turns into a very solid win condition. Next is Dream Shackle Geist, 3 mana, 3-1 three spirit at rare, which flies, and says at the beginning of combat on your turn, choose up to 1 between tapping target creature, so we can maybe get rid of a blocker for a turn, or target creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So for in a racing situation, we can keep the opponent's largest creature tap down. So that's going to make it very difficult for the opponent to race in the first place, and uh, it's not like they can easily play defense since we get to tap a creature as well if we want to. So overall the guy seems very strong, difficult to race, and uh, pretty much will require a removal spell from the opponent. Now it is only one toughness, so most removal spells will deal with it, but a simple enchantment that prevents it from attacking is not a solution, because we'll still be able to make use of that ability at the beginning of combat. So it does require a pretty specific answer. So overall, I think I'm liking an A for the Geist. Just incredibly efficient and uh, does a pretty good job if you're trying to get the opponent dead quickly. Next is Fear of Death, a two-man enchantment or at common. Enchants a creature. Gonna want to enchant an opposing creature. And when it enters a battlefield, we mill two cards, and the enchanted creature gets minus X minus O, where X is the number of cards in our graveyard. So, by itself, if we're not playing any other self-mill cards, it's not that exciting. Uh, just, even if it does get an opposing creature to zero power, it can still block, it can maybe still have additional utility. So it's not a great removal spell. The one place where I might be interested in Fear of Death is in the self mill archetype, which not only wants ways to stall out the game and prevent taking too much damage, this could be a nice answer to a big flying creature for instance, but it also wants to actively fill its graveyard to enable other synergies, so that's where Fear of Death might be playable. So I think I'm landing on C over D for Fear of Death, but probably not a card you're going to want outside of the most dedicated self-mill archetypes. Next is a Geist Light Snare, which is a 3 mana instant at uncommon, costs 1 less to cast if you control a spirit, and it also costs 1 less if you control an enchantment, so under the right circumstances could be just a single blue mana. For a conditional counterspell that counters unless the opponent pays 3 generic mana, so it's not a bad counterspell per se, especially in a deck with a few Spirits and Disturb enchantments, so this will be at its best in blue-white, obviously. That being said, the fact that it is still conditional in nature means it's quickly gonna go down in value as time progresses. Now, I guess one thing worth mentioning is these conditional counterspells do get a little bit better because of the presence of blood tokens, strangely enough, because people won't necessarily want to play out lands in the late game, they're going to be saving them up if they have access to blood tokens to discard lands later. So that's one thing that makes these conditional counter spells a little bit better. Still not super high on the snare, um, but still probably just a C, which goes up in value the more you know, spirits and enchantments you have, so in blue-white this might go up to a C+. Next is the Visionary Stitcher, Jarolf I think it's pronounced, the 3 mana 1-4 Legendary Human Wizard at rare, saying zombies you control have flying. So already a decent ability in especially uh, blue-black, which will have a lot of zombies. And then for a blue mana we can tap Jarolf and sacrifice another non-token creature and create an XX blue zombie creature token where X is the sacrificed creature's toughness. So we found another great use for the Bioloom egg, and uh, yeah, this can start making some large flying zombies. So Jarl seems like a, an excellent win condition. It takes a little bit of work to get it going. Tokens will be vulnerable to bound spells, but it's not like there's too many of those. So I think I like a B for Jarl and uh, gonna be at its best in blue-black. A Gutter Skulker, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three spirit add uncommon, cannot be blocked as long as it's attacking alone. 
So that ability also plays well in the blue white Disturb deck, which might have a few enchantments to put on the Skulker. Imagine giving it double strike, then it's attacking for six, and it will be unblockable, so that's a great synergy right there. And then it also disturbs for four mana, essentially giving that same ability to the enchanted creature. So yeah, like this card quite a bit. Worthy of a B. Can easily win a game if you can get some good blockers in play and stall out the ground. And uh, the opponent will have to eventually deal with it, at which point we can still disturb it. Ooh, next is the Hullbreaker Horror, 7 mana for a 7-8 Kraken Horror at rare. It has flash, so we can potentially ambush some very sizable cards from the opponent. Cannot be countered, and then has even more text. When we cast a spell, we can choose up to one between returning target spell we don't control to its owner's hand. So how could that be useful if we have some instance we can play? And then we can basically use those instants as kind of like a divide by zero type counter spell that bounces something back to the opponent's hand. So it's a pretty narrow use case because it does require you to have instants. But then we can also just return target a non-land permanent to its owner's hand instead. So we can bounce creatures that are already in play. I've long debated whether the Hullbreaker Horror should get an S or if it's closer to an A. I think it's close. You're probably still first picking this out of pretty much any pack, so I don't know if it really matters. I landed on an A for the whole Breaker Horror. While it is a flash card that cannot be countered, it will usually ambush a creature, but the opponent could have instant speed removal at the ready, because of course this is 7 mana, so by the time we can cast the whole Breaker Horror, the opponent could even cast their uh, 6 mana cleaved version of the what's it called, uh, Fierce Retribution. So there are definitely answers out there in a lot of colors that could kill the Hullbreaker Horror, so it doesn't necessarily have that unkillable aspect that a lot of S-tier cards have, but if the opponent cannot remove the Horror, it will easily uh, win you the game. So definitely a very powerful card that's worth first picking and gets an A. Next is Inspired Idea, 3 mana sorcery at rare, that lets us draw three cards, but gets a pretty big drawback as well. Our maximum hand size is reduced by three for the rest of the game. So not a card you want to cast on turn three, otherwise you're going to be discarding to hand size. But later in the game we have the option of either casting it for three mana and getting that drawback if we're close to empty handed anyways, or we can cast it for five mana with its cleave cost, in which case it's just a draw three without drawbacks. So Divination, this is not, not a card you want to cast on turn 3, but later in the game it can be quite a bit better. So I landed on C+, for Inspired Idea, I think it's a good card or effect, but uh, it's not the type of card that will help you hit your land drops early on, which a card like Divination might be able to. Next is Jacob Hocken. Inspector, 2 mana, 02 Mythic Rare, Legendary Human Advisor, that can tap to essentially loot, so we get to draw a card, and then instead of discarding, we exile a card from our hand face down. We can look at the exiled cards, and we can pay 6 mana after using the ability, and if we do, we can transform our looting creature into a legendary enchantment, saying at the beginning of our upkeep, exile the top card of our library face down, can still look at those exiled cards, and once during each of our turns we may play a land or cast a spell among the cards exiled with this permanent without paying its mana cost. So if we have a lot of expensive cards that early on in the game we don't have the mana to cast, we can exile those, and then hopefully at some point the opponent doesn't kill our inspector, and we can transform it into Insight, which will then give us access to those cards without paying their mana cost, so that's a pretty good deal. Of course, there is quite a bit of risk involved if you get rid of your best cards with a plan of casting them for free, and the opponent kills your Inspector, you're going to be pretty sad. So I think it's a good card, even if you never transform it, just a 2-mana 0-2 that can improve your hand 
is a nice ability to have access to. So I think I landed on a B for Jacob, powerful card, but uh, just be aware of potential drawbacks. A Lantern Bearer is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one spirit at common. It flies and has Disturb for 2 and a blue, giving Enchanted Creature plus 1 plus 1 and flying. So seems like a pretty innocuous card. Most 1 mana 1-1 one, one flyers aren't playable. I think this is quite a bit different. Not only are we playing this in a set with Exploit, which requires us to have some early sacrifice fodder, we're pretty happy to just get one or point, one or two points of damage in with a bear early, and then we can at some point sacrifice it to an exploit creature, and then later still disturb it out of the graveyard. But uh, just a disturb half by itself is quite powerful. Plus one, plus one, and flying can easily uh, turn a ground stall into a situation where you can actually win the game. So yeah. I'm Liking the uh, one drop quite a bit. I think it's worthy of a C plus. Will play well in both blue black exploit decks as well as the blue white spirit disturb deck. Next is lunar rejection, two mana instant at uncommon, and if we cast it for two mana, it can only return wolves or werewolves to its owner's hands, and we get to draw a card. So it's pretty narrow, but if you do end up playing against like a red green werewolf deck then this will be probably the best card you can have. And then if we are not facing a wolf or werewolf, we can still cast it for four mana with its cleave cost, and then we can return any creature to its owner's hand and draw a card. So nice into the royal type effect, which historically has always been quite good, and uh, this might not be quite as flexible as into the royal since we can't cast it for two mana unless it's targeting a specific creature type. So I'm not sure if this is closer to a C plus or a B. It's somewhere in between that, I think. But uh, I'll be optimistic and give Lunar Rejection a B. Next is Mirror Hall Mimic. Four mana, Spirit at Rare. And this is a clone, essentially. So it enters a battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. It can also be an opposing creature except it's a spirit in addition to its author types, which is mostly going to be an advantage. And then not only do we get a 4-mana clone, which is what we're used to paying for this effect, but we can also disturb it out of the graveyard for 5-mana. And uh, yeah, the enchantment aura side of this is pretty insane. At the beginning of our upkeep, create a token that's a copy of enchanted creature, except it's a spirit in addition to its author types. This seems very strong, especially where you may enchant an opposing creature with this. Because then what's the opponent going to do? If we're enchanting like a good card on their side of the battlefield, they can kill it with their own removal spell and two for one themselves, or they can let it stay in play and we will accumulate value over time, or they can, I guess, start turning it sideways in the hope that we eventually kill it in combat. But, uh... Yeah, this, this card seems very strong, so the best course of action for the opponent if you play the Mimic is to just not let it go to the graveyard, otherwise the enchantment side is probably more powerful than the, the front side of it. Not sure if this is quite an S tier level card, but certainly a bomb, so it gets an A. Next is Miscavus. Cantgeist, a 2-mana 1-1 one, one Cat Spirit at Uncommon, and when the Cantgeist deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. So by itself, a 1-1 one, one with this ability is going to have a hard time connecting, but we've seen a few cards that already synergize nicely with the Cantgeist, like the 1-mana Lantern Bear, for instance. If we can disturb onto the Cantgeist to give it flying, that's an easy combination. To start drawing extra cards, we've also seen the Gutter Skulker to make a creature unblockable if it's attacking alone, another great combo with the Cantgeist, and both combinations work well. We can either enchant the Cantgeist with one of those, or we can disturb the Cantgeist for 3 mana to give the enchanted creature that same ability. So another great card to potentially have milled in our graveyard or discard it somehow. And then when the enchanted creature deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card. 
So it plays very nicely with any evasive creatures, of course. So yeah, big fan of the Catgeist. It does take a little bit of work, so by itself it's not necessarily amazing, but uh, at the very least a C+. Next is Necro Duality, 4 mana enchantment at Mythic, saying whenever a non-token zombie enters a battlefield under our control, create a token that's a copy of that creature. So reminiscent of the Lajara enchantments from Kaldheim. Now, big difference here is we're limited to one creature type, and that is zombie. So it doesn't quite have that same flexibility. Now there are quite a few zombies in the sets, but even in blue, you have like your spirits cards as well. So it's only a, a subset of the blue creatures that are zombies. And then of course, black is going to have its fair share as well. So I don't think it's quite as good as the Reflections of Lejara, despite being a little cheaper, just because it doesn't go into as many decks. But uh, yeah, hopefully that means that the person drafting blue-black zombies can get this a little bit later. And uh, in that deck, it's probably going to be a fine addition, assuming you can prioritize drafting zombies. So I think this is a C, a fine card, and will be a lot of fun in the right deck, but not necessarily an incredibly high pick. Next is Overcharged Amalgam, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three zombie horror at rare, has flash and flying. So already 4 mana, 3-3 three, three flash flying would be decent. Can potentially ambush a smaller creature, opponent thinks you're keeping up a counter spell, and instead, well, I guess this is technically also a counter spell, but can also ambush a creature if needed. And then it has exploits when it enters a battlefield, in which case we can counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. Now, very important is knowing that you can sacrifice the Amalgam to itself. So if you don't have any other creatures in play, this can still be a 4-mana counterspell if you sacrifice the Amalgam to its own exploit trigger. So it does have that flexibility. But ideally, of course, you've got something else to sack and you get to keep the 3-3 flyer around. So Amalgam seems quite strong and uh, at the very least deserves a B. But uh, could see this being quite annoying to face. Next is Patchwork Crawler. 2 mana, 1, 2 zombie horror at rare, and for 2 in a blue, we can exile target creature card from our graveyard and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the crawler. And then the crawler also has all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with it. Activated abilities are nice, but we're mostly focusing on 3 mana to get a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Which is nice, it will add up over time, but it's pretty slow, starting out with a 2 mana 1-2 is below the curve, so we'll need to put a few counters on it before it actually starts to matter. So overall not super high on the patchwork crawler, but probably going to be pretty good in like a blue-green self-mill deck, so I'll give it a C. Next is Repository Scab, 4 mana for a 3-3 zombie at common with exploit, and when it exploits a creature, return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. So this is a bit of a weird one in the sense that the non-creature or instant and sorcery half of it will be at its best in blue-red, but most of the creatures you want to sacrifice are actually in black as opposed to blue-red. So it's a bit of an awkward card, um, probably just going to be at its best in like a blue-black zombie deck where you have sufficient number of creatures you want to sacrifice and you might be able to get back a black removal spell or like a blue card draw spell, even if you don't have a ton of those. So overall, Scam gets a C. Pretty narrow, but can be a fine card in the right deck. Next is Scattered Thoughts, 4 mana instant at common, letting us look at the top 4 cards of our library, putting 2 of those cards into our hand and the rest into our graveyard. This card's awesome, very much reminiscent of cards like Behold the Multiverse, uh, probably going to see quite a few comparisons with the Organ Hoarder from Midnight Hunt. Don't think it's quite as good as Organ Hoarder, doesn't give you a board presence, but it does provide card advantage as well as putting extra cards in the graveyard, which has quite a bit of utility in the set with Disturb and other cards that care about filling the graveyard. So the real question is, does this get up to the B range? Or is it a C plus? Because it's certainly at the very least a C plus. 
It is an instant, there's quite a few blue counter spells in the set that might play well with it. So Scattered Thoughts goes into a lot of decks. It's perfect for pretty much any blue deck. Blue-white, Disturbed Spirits have that Disturbed Synergy. Blue-black might also have a few Graveyard Synergies. Then we have Blue-green that cares about self-milling. This is a way to fill the graveyard. And uh, Blue-red cares about non-creature spells, and this is a non-creature spell. So kind of fits into all the different archetypes. So I think I'm leaning towards C+. People are probably going to be comparing it too much to Organ Hoarder and might overvalue it slightly. So maybe not a card you're going to see much in the early weeks of the format, but uh, certainly powerful. So happy to have pretty much as many of these as I can get my hands on. But I'll start out with a more conservative C+. Next is Screaming Swarm, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four Bird Horror and Uncommon with Flying. Kind of expensive, but 4-4 four, four Flyer is quite large. And then whenever we attack with one or more creatures, target player mills that many cards. So I don't think we're going to be targeting the opponent with this very often, more of a, a self-mill card to potentially enable more graveyard synergies. And... Uh, yeah, if we're milling the opponents while attacking with a 4-4 flyer, then the opponent's probably going to be dead to damage before they die to the mill. So it's a bit bit of a weird ability. And then for 2 and a blue, we can put Screaming Swarm from our graveyard into our library, second from the top. So if we're playing like a blue-green self-mill deck that has ways to ramp and ways to put cards in our graveyard, that's probably the best home for the Screaming Swarm, as we'll have the mana to cast it and the time to uh, put it back into our deck to eventually cast it, as well as potentially putting even more stuff in our graveyard. So yeah, Screaming Swarm, fine card in a pretty narrow deck, I think, which is going to be blue-green. I'll give it a C, not an incredibly high pick. Next is Selhoff and Tumor, 2 mana, 1-3 zombie at common that can tap and discard a creature card specifically in order to draw a card. So it's a looter, but not the type of looter that you actively want, since it's usually lands you want to be discarding late game as opposed to creatures. Now it is potentially a way to get those disturbed creatures in the graveyard to then get the aura half of it. So I could see a few decks where this is playable, but overall not very high on it. I'll give it a D. Next is Serpentine Ambush. Two mana instant at common. Until end of turn, target creature becomes a blue serpent with base power and toughness 5-5. Five five. Historically, these abilities aren't very good, and don't see a major reason why it would be any different in this set. So, I'm gonna give this a D, just kind of a bad pump spell. Next is Skywarp Scab, 5 mana, 2-5 zombie drake at common, with flying. And when the scab enters the battlefield, you may exile two creature cards from your graveyard, and if you do, draw a card. So 2-5 is a lot of toughness, and then if we get to draw a card, this card seems excellent. That's not always going to be trivial, but especially in like a blue-green self-mill deck, that might have an easier time enabling the scab. So I'm going to go with an optimistic C+. If we compare this to the 4-mana draw 2, the scab compares favorably if we reliably can draw the card, as we also get a nice board presence at the same time. So yeah, I think both are going to be quite good, but we'll see which one ends up being the better common. Next is Soul Cipher board, 2 mana artifact at uncommon, and the board enters the battlefield with 3 omen counters on it. And for one and a blue, we can tap it and look at the top two cards of our library, putting one of them into our graveyard. So it gives us a minimal amount of card selection at a very slow rate. And then whenever a creature card is put into our graveyard from anywhere, so it could be from using the ability, but could also be from just a creature dying, then we can remove an omen counter from the board. So we start out with three counters, get remove one, whenever a creature is put into our graveyard. And then if it has no omen counters on it, it transforms into Cypherbound Spirit. A 3-2 flyer can only block creatures with flying. 
and for four mana we get to draw two and then discard. So it does provide card advantage with the activated ability, which is nice, but it doesn't block very well, and uh, it does take a while to get it to transform into the spirit, especially if we top deck the board late in the game. So I think it's just a little bit too slow to get the creature half of it, even though it is true you could play the board and never activate it, just play it for two mana, and then after a few turns it will eventually transform if enough creatures die. In those decks, maybe with enough like exploit synergies, maybe the board is good enough. But if we have to activate it two or three times to transform it, I don't think I'm going to be very happy. So I'm pretty pessimistic on the uh, Soul Cipher board, going to start out with a D. But I hope I'm proven wrong, because it seems like a fun card to play with. Next is Steelclad Spirit 2 mana, 3-3 three, three Spirit at common with Defender. So good early defense, and whenever an enchantment enters battlefield under our control, the Spirit can attack, as though it didn't have Defender this turn. So perfect for the blue-white Disturb archetype, where you're going to have a lot of evasive creatures to fly over and potentially kill the opponent, but if you're not protecting yourself on the ground, the uh, opponent's going to have an easy time racing you, but a nice 2-mana 3-3 three, three can jump in front and soak up a lot of damage, and then potentially sneak in a few attacks as well if we eventually disturb those enchantments. So I like a C for Steel Clan Spirit. Not going to go into many blue decks, but in blue-white specifically it will be pretty solid. Next is Stitched Assistant, 3 mana, 3-2 three, zombie at common with exploit, and when it exploits a creature we get to scry one and then draw a card. Yeah, fine card. Gonna be at its best in blue-black as I've said a few times when talking about these exploit creatures, but even combined with like the 1 mana Lantern Bearer for instance, that might be a fine creature to sacrifice and then get some extra value. So. Seems like a playable card. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily overrate it, so probably closer to a C than a C plus on the Stitched Assistant. And next is Storm Chaser Drake, two mana, two one Drake at uncommon with flying. And when the Drake becomes a target of a spell we control, we get to draw a card. So don't get to draw a card if the opponent kills it with a removal spell, sadly. But in blue red, there's a few ways to pump it up, and yeah, I mean, a 2-1 flyer for 2 is already kind of decent. Doesn't have the drawback of not being able to block, which is often what we see on these 2-mana flyers. So yeah, the Drake seems perfect for like an aggressive blue-red spells deck that might have a few pump spells or other ways of targeting. As we'll see in red, there's a pretty good one at 1 mana, which is the perfect way to target the Drake. So in blue-red spells, I'm pretty happy with the uh, the Drake and might even go up to a B. And then Syncopate is another reprint, X and a blue for a counter spell that counters target spell unless its controller pays X, but we have the extra upside of exiling that spell if it gets countered, which is quite relevant in a set full of uh, disturb cards. So a relevant upside. Still not super high on Syncopates, but uh, probably just a C. Siphon Essence, two and a blue for yet another counter spell. So we've seen quite a number of these. Instant at common, counter target creature or planeswalker spell, and we get to create a blood token. Yeah, probably just another C. Don't have a reason to give it much higher of a grade. Next is Thirst for Discovery, 3 mana instant at uncommon, get to draw 3 and then discard 2 cards unless we discard a basic land card. So if we draw 3 and then discard 2, we just got to you know filter through the deck since we didn't really get any card advantage, but especially late game when we don't need lands anymore, draw 3, discard a land, get up some uh, card advantage and drawing 3 lets us dig pretty deep. So I like Thirst for Discovery quite a bit, and I'll give it a B. Next is Wanderlight Spirit, 3 mana, 2-3 spirit at common. It flies and can only block 
creatures with flying. I'm not a huge fan of this. You know, a flyer typically doesn't want to do much blocking and wants to be turning sideways. Three toughness does mean it does a reasonable job of blocking some of those wide flyers we've seen. There's a lot of like two ones and two threes that would necessarily be able to attack past it. Yeah, not being able to block ground creatures is a severe drawback and uh, means that this will only go into the most aggressive blue decks, which, you know, I guess blue whites might be one of those decks, but typically blue tends to be on the more controlling end of the spectrum. So, yeah, not super high on Wanderlight Spirit. Somewhere between a C and a D for me. I'm going to start out with a D, just kind of as a statement not to overvalue this. Next is Wash Away, 1 mana instant, and uncommon. And it's a counter spell. If we cast it for 1 mana, it counters only spells that weren't cast from their owner's hands. So, pretty narrow, but... The fact that it's just upside on an otherwise 3 mana hard counter if we cast it with cleave makes this pretty interesting. So this will be a perfect way to punish those disturb auras that uh, are cast from the graveyard. There might be a few cards that get cast from exile, which this can counter as well for a single mana. And of course, thinking about standard, pretty good against foretell. So overall, wash away might sneak its way into the C+, plus as opposed to most of the other counterspells I've seen so far, just because, you know, a single blue for a counterspell is much easier to keep up, and you can sort of see it coming if the opponent has a powerful Disturb card in their graveyard, then uh, it's not too difficult to keep up one blue mana. So C+, plus for Wash Away. Next is Whispering Wizard, or should I say Whispering Wizard. Four mana for a 3-2 Human Wizard and Uncommon, saying whenever we cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying, only triggers once each turn. So reminiscent of the 1-5 uh, from Ravnica that made the bird tokens, this only triggers once each turn, which is a pretty big difference. It's only a 3-2, so it doesn't block very well, and it's not a card you typically want to put in harm's way. It's still decent, making lots of 1-1 one, one flyers over time, is quite strong, so this will be at its best in like the blue-red spells archetype. And it can still trigger in the opponent's turn, so can maybe trigger it once in our turn, and then if we have an instance, we can trigger it in the opponent's turn as well. So, yeah, overall, Whispering Wizard, I think, gets a B. Will be great in blue-red. Next is Winged Portent, 3 mana instant at rare, drawing a card for each creature with flying you control. Pretty narrow, so I wouldn't be playing this for 3 mana very often. And if we want to instead cast it for 6 mana, we get to draw a card for each creature we control, full stop. So for 6 mana it's powerful, but seems a bit expensive. At 3 mana it seems a bit narrow, so not a fan of this card. Give it a D, we've got better card draw effects available in blue. Next is Witness the Future 3 mana sorcery at uncommon. This is a bit of a weird one. Target player shuffles up to 4 target cards from their graveyard into their library. And then you look at the top 4 cards of your library, putting one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's this very weird cantrip that can also act as pseudo graveyard hate. And not a fan of it. Give it a D. And then last but not least, Wretched Throng, a 2-mana two 2-1 two zombie horror at common. And when the throng dies, you may search your library for a card named Wretched Throng, reveal it, and put it into your hand. So this will be pretty fun in an exploit-heavy deck, where you can play this turn 2, maybe get an attack in, and then later sacrifice it to find another one, and then you can keep exploiting more and more of these. Uh, outside of the exploit deck, doesn't seem amazing. What's the sweet spot for number of throngs in the deck? My guess is like probably two or three. I don't think I would want many more of them. But uh, yeah, fun card. And uh, I always like these cards that incentivize you for drafting multiple copies. But probably still just a C.
And our first black card, aim for the head, 3 mana sorcery at common, letting us choose one between exiling target zombie or target opponent exiles two cards from their hand. Now, aim for the head is a pretty interesting one. If we compare it to the discard two from Midnight Hunt, it does have a few things going for it. Exiling two cards, big difference between discarding two cards means if the opponent is holding Disturb cards, they wouldn't be able to get value from them, which was uh, kind of the problem with discard effects in Midnight Hunt between Disturb and Flashback. The opponent was usually pretty happy with uh, discarding those and being able to get them back. So Aim for the Hads addresses those issues. And then it has the random upside of exiling a zombie, which, you know, there's a decent number of zombies in the set. So still not super high on Aim for the Head, but a C seems appropriate. Next is Arch Ghoul of Thraben. The 3 mana 3 2 zombie cleric at uncommon says whenever the ghoul or another zombie you control dies, look at the top card of your library. If it's a zombie card, you may reveal it, put it into your hand. If you don't, you can decide to put it into your graveyard instead. Not going to be super likely to reveal all that many zombies with it, unless you drafted a very dedicated zombies deck, that's probably more for constructed. But just the option of essentially like surveilling, deciding whether to keep a card on top or putting it in your graveyard is still decent. And it's all stapled onto a 3 mana 3-2, which is not too embarrassing. So a C plus for this seems fine. Next is Bleed Dry, 4 mana instant at common, giving a creature minus 30, minus 13 until end of turn, and if that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. So this is going to be the premium removal spell in black, instant speed, exiles, so not much more you can ask of this. So this is a B. Blood Fountain, a 1 mana artifact at common. When it enters the battlefield, we create a blood token, and now that we're in black, we're going to see many more of these cards making blood tokens. And for 4 mana, we can sacrifice the fountain to return up to 2 target creature cards from our graveyard to our hand. So, we often see these sort of effects at common in black to get back creatures from the graveyard. This version seems okay, a little bit expensive at 4 mana, when uh, cards like Soul Salvage are only 3. But on the other hand, we also get an extra blood token, which can help us loot away lands in the first place, or maybe even discard a creature that we can later get back with Blood Fountain in case there's not enough creatures in the graveyard to begin with. So it does have a little bit of synergy there too. So yeah, I like Blood Fountain, probably happy to have at least one of these in most black creature decks. Next is Blood Graced Socialite, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three Vampire at common, has menace, and when a socialite enters the battlefield, create a blood token. And whenever the socialite attacks, we may sacrifice a token. And if we do, it gets plus two plus two until end of turn, a blood token specifically. So by itself, a 3-3 three, three menace can potentially attack once as a 5-5. Five, five. That's okay. Uh, but it really starts getting great when we have other cards that make blood tokens. Because if this can consistently attack as a 5-5 five, five menace, it's definitely a, a very high-powered card. So in the right deck, which is presumably like a black-red vampire deck with lots of blood tokens, I think the socialite might get up to a C+. Plus. So I'm hopeful that this will be a solid common. Next is a Bloodsworn Squire. Four mana for a 3-3 vampire soldier at uncommon. And this one's also a mouthful. So for one on a black, we can discard a card, and then the squire gains indestructible until end of turn. We have to tap it. So already, just, I guess, random upside on top of a 4 mana 3-3, three, three, which is not too exciting to begin with. Then if there are four or more creature cards in our graveyard, we get to transform the squire. So interesting to note about the squire, we can potentially block with it, and then still use the ability to discard, give it indestructible. And then, especially if it also happens to transform, things get interesting. So if it transforms, it turns into Bloodsworn Knight, whose power and toughness are each equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. So it is possible for the opponent to maybe attack with like a 4-4 creature. 
you can block the Squire, use the ability, and then before damage it might transform into the Bloodsworn Knight, which is hopefully at least a 4-4, and then you can get a favorable trade, as it's still going to be indestructible. So those are kind of the scenarios where this card might be decent. Yeah, I guess um, probably like a C for the Bloodsworn Squire. Next is a Blood Vial Purveyor, 4 mana for a creature vampire at rare. It's a 5-6. It has Flying and Trample, so there must be some sort of catch, because they usually don't print cards as pushed as this. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, that player creates a blood token, so that's the drawback. But the drawback is also sort of an advantage. Whenever the purveyor attacks, it gets plus one plus zero for each blood token defending player controls. The more blood tokens the opponent gets, the harder the purveyor hits. Yeah, this card seems pretty strong. Uh, can end the game in just four attacks, maybe even three attacks. And uh, some decks have trouble dealing with a six toughness creature. So this is. At the very least, an A, but uh, you know there are answers to it, especially like enchantments or the black removal spell at common, and then it will leave behind a couple blood tokens for the opponent that will eventually give them an advantage in the late game. So it's not without its drawbacks, but if unanswered, it will certainly end the game very quickly. So a bomb it is. Next is the catapult fodder, three mana, one five zombie at uncommon, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn. If you control three or more creatures that each have toughness greater than their power, we get to transform it. So the perfect home for this is going to be the black-green Toughness Matters deck. And then it transforms into Catapult Captain, a 2-6 zombie at uncommon, that for three mana can tap and sacrifice another creature, and then target opponent loses life equal to the sacrificed creature's toughness. And there are some very high toughness creatures in the set, so the captain could end the game in just a handful of activations. So yeah, in the black-green Toughness Matters deck, this seems awesome, and I'm willing to give this a B, but not a card you're necessarily going to want outside of it. Then we've got Cemetery Desecrator, part of the Mythic Rare Cemetery cycle. This a 6 mana, 4-4 four, four zombie with menace. When it enters battlefield or dies, Exile another card from a graveyard. When you do, get to choose one between removing X counters from target permanence, where X is the mana value of the exiled card, or target creature an opponent controls gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is once again the mana value of the exiled card. So, under the right circumstances, this is a 6 mana 4-4 four, four that kills a creature when it enters and kills a creature when it dies which is a very good deal, and at least worthy of an A. Next is Concealing Curtains, a 1 mana 04 wall at rare has Defender, so it plays well in the high toughness black green deck. And then 2 and a black to transform Concealing Curtains and Sorcery Speed into Revealing Eye, a 3-4 eye horror at rare with Menace. And when this creature transforms into the Revealing Eye, target opponent has to reveal their hand. You choose a non-land card from it, and that player has to discard that card and then draw a card. So it's a May ability, so we don't have to choose anything. And uh, all in all, we paid 4 mana. Although, that being said, at, on turn 1 you're usually not doing much, so playing the Curtains turn 1 is pretty easy, gives you a blocker for a few turns and then eventually turns into a 3-4 menace for just 3 mana, with upside, because you just get to see the opponent's hands, maybe take away a bomb. And uh, yeah, that's all pure upside, so this card seems awesome, at the very least a B, and might even have some constructed applications. Next is Courier Bat, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two bats at uh, common, has flying, and when it enters a battlefield, if you gained life this turn, Return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So, a little bit awkward in the sense that by turn three, when you want to play this on curve, 
there might not be anything in the graveyard to get back, or you might not have the life gain set up to enable it. So it's a 3-drop that's not really a 3-drop, making it a little bit less exciting. But in the late game, if all the circumstances are lining up, it can definitely be a nice 2-for-1. So I'm going to give the career bat a C. Next is Demonic Bargain, a 3-mana sorcery at rare, exiling the top 13 cards from your library. And then you get to search your library for any card and put that card into your hand. Typically these tutor effects, we have to pay like 4 mana for them, are not playable. This one is only 3 mana, but still doesn't seem very good. If you've got like one bomb that you want to search up, there's a chance you you exile it, and it's not even left in your library. So like the one scenario where I might consider this, if my deck is like 2 or 3, unbeatable bombs that if I cast them I win the game, but uh, those are pretty narrow circumstances. So this gets a D. Next is Desperate Farmer, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two human peasant at common, has a lifelink, saying whenever another creature you control dies, get to transform it into the Depraved Harvester, a 4-3 with a lifelink. So 4-3, lifelink for 3 is pretty good. It's not always going to be easy to transform, so at its best in maybe like a blue-black exploit deck that actively sacrifices its own creatures, and then having a lifelink of course plays well in the black-white life gain archetype as well. Still not super high on it, but at the very least a C playable card. Next is Dargraph Scavenger, 4 mana, 2-3 zombie bear at common with death touch, when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target card from a graveyard, and if a creature card was exiled this way, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So maybe a nice enabler for the life gain deck. Four mana, kind of expensive for a death touch creature, which you would prefer to be a little bit cheaper, so it can uh, be played and then trade off for a large creature from the opponent. The random drain two is nice, but Still probably just a C, nothing exciting, but a playable curve filler if needed. Next is Doomed Dissenter. So a reprint, but with some pretty cool new art. 2 mana, 1-1 one, one human at common, and when it dies, create a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. So this is perfect for the blue-black exploit decks that need some sacrifice fodder, and you're pretty happy to sacrifice the Doomed Dissenter. So... I'm going to place a pretty high value on the Doom Dissenter, just because there aren't too many creatures we've seen so far that we're happy to be sacrificing early. We've seen like the 1-1 Flyer with Disturb, we've seen the Egg, but that's an uncommon. So at common there's not that many, and Doom Dissenter is going to be perfect. Next is Dreadfugue, 1 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon. And if we cast it for only 1 mana, then target player reveals their hand, we choose a non-land card from it with mana value 2 or less, that player discards that card. So an incredibly narrow discard spell, I think we're only casting it for 1 mana in Constructed, in some very uh, low curve formats, but we can also cast it for 3 mana with Cleave, in which case the mana value is still 1, but in that case we can take any non-land card from the opponent's hand, to make them discard. So it's targeted discard at 3 mana, kind of expensive, and I don't imagine many scenarios where we're casting it for 1, so yeah, not that uh, excited about Fugue. Could be a sideboard card if the opponent has some unbeatable bomb with Hexproof maybe, that you don't have any other way of removing if you're playing black and don't have access to counter spells, but uh, not a card I would recommend main decking. Then we've got Dreadfeast Demon, 7 mana for a 6-6 demon at rare. It has flying, and at the beginning of your end step, sacrifice a non-demon creature. This is not a may ability, so you have to sacrifice something, but that's usually going to be to your advantage, because if you do create a token, that's a copy of a Dreadfeast Demon. So it's also going to copy the ability. So at some point you're going to have only demons in play, but 
It specifically says sacrifice a non-demon creature, so it's not going to force you to sacrifice the demon itself. So all your creatures are slowly going to turn into these 6-6 flyers, and uh, it's not going to take long for those to end the game. So I think I'm giving the demon an S. Reason I'm giving it an S over an A is that this triggers at the beginning of your end step. So it doesn't take much for you to control any random non-demon creature. Play this at 7. 7 is expensive, so going to be pretty soft to counter spells, but under most circumstances you play this on 7, sacrifice a creature right away, make another Dreadfeast Demon. So even if the opponent has a removal spell in their turn, you're still going to be left with an additional Dreadfeast Demon, which is just going to keep on making more and more 6-6 six, six flyers. So this meets that kind of requirement I have for some of my S-tier level cards of being incredibly powerful, ending the game quickly, but at the same time, even if the opponent does have a removal spell at the ready, they might still lose to it because they didn't cast it at instant speed or it was just a sorcery speed removal spell and you managed to make a copy before they kill the demon and the copy is still going to win the game for you. So yeah, I think Dreadfeast Demon gets an S. Of course at 7 mana it is expensive, S-tier level cards at 7 mana don't necessarily win you the game if you can get to 7 mana to begin with. But once this uh, card resolves, it should win you the game. Next is Dying to Serve, 3 mana enchantment at rare, saying whenever you discard one or more cards, create a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token, only triggers once each turn. So we've seen a couple cards referencing discarding cards, we've seen like the white 2-drop that uh, let us discard cards to flicker it, and then we've seen a few cards in black as well like the 4-mana uh, Uncommon Knights that made us discard to make it indestructible, so those are potential ways of enabling Dying to Serve. Plays well with Blood Tokens, which can discard cards in the late game. So in a Blood-heavy deck that can make a lot of Blood Tokens, maybe this is worth it. But uh, a lot of the Blood Tokens we will be sacrificing to other effects instead of discarding lands in the late game, for instance. So this feels a little bit too slow and a little bit too conditional, so I'm gonna give it a D. But uh, yeah, I could see like a deck that can make a lot of blood tokens be interested in this. Then we've got Adgar's Awakening, 5 mana sorcery at uncommon, saying return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand, or to the battlefield rather. So we've seen these 5 mana reanimation effects quite a bit in the past. They're usually fine but unexciting. And the uh, twist here is when we discard the Awakening, we can pay a single black, and when we do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand instead. So let's say we sacrifice a blood token, then we can cast this for one mana instead of five, but instead of putting the creature on the battlefield, we return it to our hand instead. So, yeah, it's an okay twist on the five mana reanimation effect. Has pseudo madness, if you will. But um, again, there's not that many amazing synergies with it or like awesome creatures to reanimate necessarily that you can set this up with. So still just going to give this a C. But uh, yeah, maybe you can make a sweet reanimator deck enabled by a blood token sense and Gar's Awakening. Next is Falconrath, 4 bear, 3 mana, 3 1 vampire with flying at rare. Cannot block, full stop, so can't even block opposing flyers. But when it deals combat damage to a player, we get to make a blood token, and we can pay a black and sacrifice two blood tokens to return the forebear from our graveyard to the battlefield. So we could even make blood tokens some other way, maybe mill the forebear or discard it somehow, and then we could still potentially reanimate it and get a nice recursive 3-1. So it's a powerful card. Under the right circumstances, you want to be aggressive because it can block. So not a card you want in a slow grindy deck that uh, doesn't have a ton of removal. Otherwise, you're gonna get in trouble. But uh, yeah, the forebear seems like a nice recursive threat, and I'm gonna give it a B. Seems great in an aggressive black red vampire deck with access to a lot of blood tokens. Felstinger, 3 mana, 3 2 zombie scorpion at uncommon, has death touch. 
So 3 mana, 3 to death touch, not bad. But also has exploits when it enters a battlefield, and if it exploits a creature, target player draws two cards and loses two life. So a sign in blood effect. So yeah, this card seems great. If we can curve Doom the Center into Felstinger, sacrifice Doom the Center, make it 2 2 zombie, draw two at the cost of two life, and get a 3 2 death touch. That's a common into an uncommon, not an unusual curve. Seems pretty great to me. So I'll give Felstinger a B. Just make sure you have enough sacrifice fodder to go with it, since you don't want to be sacrificing the Stinger itself to draw two. Next is a Gift of Fangs, 1 mana, Enchantment Aura at common, giving Enchanted Creature plus 2 plus 2 as long as it's a Vampire, otherwise it gets minus 2 minus 2. So I think it was called Immolation in Midnight Hunt. Had a somewhat similar effect, giving plus 2 minus 2, but didn't see a ton of play since the red decks cared about instants and sorceries and it was an enchantment. Gift of Fangs is somewhat similar, can kill small creatures at just one mana, so can maybe be a good sideboard card if the opponent has a lot of low toughness, evasive creatures you need to deal with. Assuming they're not vampires, otherwise it's not gonna work. So in a vampire deck where you have the flexibility of plus two plus two and minus two minus two, it does get a little bit better, but I'm usually not interested in one mana auras that give my creatures plus two plus two. So you you're really playing Gift of Fangs mostly for the minus two half. So yeah, not sold on it. Probably still a playable card, but uh, not more than a C. Next is Gluttonous Guest, 3 mana, 1-4 Vampire at common. When it enters the battlefield, create a blood token, and whenever we sacrifice a blood token, we gain 1 life. So we may be sacrificing it to the ability of the blood token itself, or it could be some other card that makes us sacrifice it. Thinking of the 4-mana uh, Blood Crazed Socialite, for instance, that can also enable us to gain 1 life. So the Gluttonous Guest goes into a lot of different decks. It's a high toughness creature for the black green high toughness deck, it's a vampire with blood token synergy for the black red vampire deck, and it also gains life which could be relevant for the black white deck. So it strikes a nice balance of uh, fitting into a lot of different decks. It's not amazing in any of them, but it's playable, so it gets a C. Next up we have the Graf Reaver, 2 mana 3-3 three, three zombie warrior at rare has exploits, and when it exploits a creature, destroy target planeswalker. So not gonna come up in limited very often. So it's a 2 mana, 3-3, three, three, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, the reaver deals 1 damage to you. So pretty severe drawback. 2 mana, we expect to get like a 2-2 two, two creature instead, so this is a little bit larger, but we pay the price for it. So late game, if the opponent has a larger creature out there, this doesn't necessarily attack all that well, but still loses us life. So the opponent can just kind of sit back and let the Graf Reaver kill us. So not a fan of the Graf Reaver. I'm not sure if this is more of a C or more of a D. I'll give it a C still, since I could see it being okay in a very aggressive black deck. If you play this on turn 2 and you're the aggressor, of course you don't care about losing life. But uh, it's going to be pretty awkward late in the game. Next is a Grizzly Ritual, 6 mana for a sorcery that destroys target creature or planeswalker. And then we get to make two blood tokens as well. So at 6 mana it is expensive, but it's also at the point of the game where if you have 6 lands in play you're very happy to discard any additional lands you draw. So those two blood tokens are gonna do a lot of work for you. So. Ritual certainly playable, but probably don't have room for a lot of these in your deck, maybe one or two at best. So I'll give it a C. Next is Groom's Finery, which is the other half of our equipment we saw in white. So an artifact equipment gives equipped creature plus two plus O, and it gets an additional plus O plus two in death touch as long as an equipment named a bride's gown is attached to a creature we control and equips for 2 mana. So once again, kind of a glorified Marauder's Axe. Chances of having both equipped at the same time are pretty low, and uh, 
at least the white equipment plays well with the training mechanic. The groom's finery is kind of in the wrong colors, in a way. So doesn't even have that going for it. So I'm going to give this a D as well, but it's probably worse than the white one. Next is Headless Rider, 3 mana, 3-1 three zombie at rare. When the rider or another non-token zombie you control dies, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Yeah, this card seems good. A 3-1 that replaces itself when it dies, and uh, especially in blue-black you're going to have lots of other zombies that will trade off. So if those leave behind an additional 2-2, you're pretty happy. So Headless Rider gets an easy B. Next is Henrika Domnathi, a 4-mana 1-3 legendary vampire at Mythic Rare. It flies and says at the beginning of combat on your turn, choose one that hasn't been chosen between each player sacrifices a creature, which should be pretty good in black where you've got all those sacrifice fodder creatures like Doom Center. You can draw a card at the cost of one life, always a nice ability. And then finally we can transform Henrika. So if we want to, we can transform Henrika right away, or we can try and get a bit more value if the other modes seem appealing. And then she eventually transforms into Infernal Seer, a 3-4 with Flying, Death Touch and Life Link. So great stats. And for one and double black, each creature you control with either Flying, Death Touch and or Life Link gets plus one plus so until end of turn. Yeah, this is a bomb, gets an A. All the abilities on the front are useful, even though you start out with a somewhat smaller creature. But uh, once you get Henrika, incredibly difficult to race, so pretty much a must answer card for the opponent. And then Hero's Downfall reprinted. I had a bit of a double take when I saw the rarity reprinted at Uncommon, so it makes me feel a bit old. 3 mana instant destroys target creature or planeswalker. Once upon a time, one of the best cards in standard, now just an uncommon in draft. But uh, that being said, still a very good card in limited. Easy B, probably one of the best removal spells in the set. Next is Innocent Traveler, 4 mana, 1 3 human and uncommon. At the beginning of your upkeep, any opponent may sacrifice a creature. If no one does, we get to transform the Innocent Traveler and transforms into Malicious Invader, a 3-3 flyer, and the invader gets plus 2 plus 0 as long as an opponent controls a human. So, pretty fun card. Uh, overall, not insane stats. If we transform it right away, assuming the opponent doesn't want to sack anything, we get access to a 4-mana 3-3 flyer. Under the best circumstances, the opponent has a human, in which case it's a 5-3 flyer, which is quite a bit better than a 3-3, so has the potential to be amazing, but if the opponent's playing a human deck, they might want to delay transforming the invader by sacrificing creatures, which, you know, depending on their board state, they might have a few tokens they don't mind sacrificing. So, a good card, but the opponent has a bit of say over whether or not it transforms, and whenever you're giving the opponent a decision, a card typically gets a little bit worse, even though both sides, of course, are quite powerful. So I ended up giving this a C plus, powerful, but uh, never great when the opponent has a say. Next is Mind Leech Ghoul, 2 mana for a 2-2 zombie at common with exploit, and when the ghoul exploits a creature, each opponent exiles a card from their hand. Yeah, fine 2 drop for the exploit deck. The major problem is if we cast this on turn 2, there's probably not that many creatures we want to be sacrificing, but as I've mentioned a few times, we can also ex or uh, sacrifice the ghoul to its own exploit ability. So it can just be two mana for opponent exiles a card from their hand, which is not a great ability, but if you're maybe top decking this in the late game, when a 2-2 two -two doesn't matter and the opponent might have a bomb in hand, you do get that upside. So a 2-2 two -two with upside gets a C. Next is Parasitic Grasp, 2 mana instant at uncommon. And if we cast it without cleave, it deals 3 damage to target human creature, and we gain 3 life. So an amazing removal spell, and it doesn't cost much more to cast it 
for its cleave cost of 3, in which case we can deal 3 to any creature, and we gain 3 life. So a great removal spell, also very good enabler for the life gain deck, if that has a few cards that care about gaining a life. And uh, yeah, not much more to say about this one. Easily a B. Next is Path of Peril. A 3 mana sorcery that destroys all creatures with mana value 2 or less. That also includes tokens. So kind of a narrow effect, but it does have the flexibility of casting it for 6 mana thanks to cleave. Although it does require a second color, so we'll have to be black-white or splashing white at the very least. In which case we can destroy all creatures full stop. So sweepers are historically powerful in limited, and it's probably no different here. And uh, probably even more so than in Midnight Hunt, where a lot of disturbed creatures came in onto the battlefield as creatures. Now the disturbed cards enter as auras, so if you destroy all creatures and the opponent doesn't have anything to enchant, they're not going to be very helpful. There's no flashback mechanic. So I think sweepers might be even better here than they were in Midnight Hunt. And uh, I've definitely gotten destroyed by the uh, white sweeper in that set, or maybe a burned house down. So Path of Peril is powerful, 6 mana is a little pricey, and you're only getting the best of it in a black-white deck, so it's a little bit narrow. So that makes me go with a B as opposed to an A, which I gave the white sweeper. Next up is Persistent Specimen. 1 mana, 1-1 one, one skeleton at common, for 2 and a black, can return it from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So another perfect creature to sacrifice for the exploit deck. Plays well in like a self-mill deck maybe. Black green has a few cards, especially in green, to mill ourselves and put more cards in the graveyard. So yeah, a neat card. Um, comes into play tapped, so we can chum block with it right away. But it is good at chum blocking creatures over the course of multiple turns. And uh, yeah, on turn one we're typically not doing much. So just a nice one drop to have. So might be overrating it slightly, but I just want to put a high priority on these creatures that we want to sacrifice to exploit. So I'm going to give this a C plus and we'll see where we end up. Next is Pointed Discussion, 2 and a black sorcery. You draw two, you lose two, and create a blood token. So, pretty common effect to see in black these days. Draw two at the cost of two life for three mana. In this case, it's not an instant, but we can also make a blood token. So, playable card, nothing exciting. Give this a C. Next is a Ragged Recluse. Two mana for a two one human peasant at common saying at the beginning of your end step, if you discarded a card this turn, we can transform it. So the easiest way to discard cards is with blood tokens, of course. And then we get a 3-3, the Odious Witch, that whenever it attacks, defending player loses one life, and we gain one life. So a 3-3 with a useful ability. Although, to be fair, by the time we get a blood token and sacrifice a blood token, we're probably past turn 4, so at that point the 3-3, three, three, while nice, is not necessarily going to have an easy time attacking. So, yeah, not super high on this card in general, but it seems playable, so I'll give it a C. Next is Restless Bloodseeker, 2 mana for a 1-3 vampire at uncommon, saying at the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, create a blood token, and we can sack two blood tokens to transform the Bloodseeker at sorcery speed. So we've seen a few cards that care about gaining life. Haven't seen a ton of convincing ways to easily gain life. We've seen like the 1-1 one, one that can tap to gain one life. That seems like the most consistent way of gaining life early on. So it's possible I might have slightly underrated that card. But let's see what the payoff is here. If we transform Bloodseeker, it transforms into Bloodsoaked Reveler, a 3-3, saying at the beginning of our end step, if we gain life, create a blood token, and for 5 mana we get an activated ability to drain the opponent for 2. So they lose 2 and we gain 2. Yeah, a reasonable mana sink, but it does take a little bit of work to transform it. 
so it's not going to be trivial. Presumably at its best in black-white, but black-red has more ways of making blood tokens, so it's going to be easier to maybe transform it in black-red by just making tokens without needing to gain life. So it's okay. Um, still not super high on it. think I'm going to land on a C. But uh, if it can go uncontested, you can stall out the board, then the activated ability of the transformed side could easily win you the game. Next is Rot Tide Gargantua, a 5 mana 5 4 zombie kraken with exploit. And when the Gargantua exploits a creature, each opponent sacrifices a creature. So this can be decent in the right deck where we've got cards like the Skeleton at 1 mana, Doom Descender at 2, things we don't mind sacrificing to exploit. In a pinch, let's say the opponent has an incredible bomb as their only creature, we can also sacrifice the Gargantua to its own exploit trigger just to make the opponent sacrifice a creature. So it does have that going for it. And then a 5-4 is a reasonable size at 5 mana. So seems playable, but probably not more than a C. Next is Skulking Killer. 4 mana for a 4-2 Vampire Assassin at Uncommon, and when it enters a battlefield, target creature an opponent controls gets minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, if that opponent controls no other creatures. Otherwise it's just a 4 mana 4-2. So this card can be incredibly painful to face if uh, things line up, or it can be pretty awkward 4 mana 4-2 that doesn't do anything. So it's a very swingy card. Uh, probably going to be much better on the play than on the draw. I, I don't love the card from like a design perspective because it's either going to be an incredible feels bad if it lines up or it's going to be pretty bad. And it's mostly play draw dependent which one it's going to be. But um, yeah, I mean, it can certainly be powerful, especially when paired with additional removal spells or cards that force the opponent to trade. So. I think I'm going to end up on C plus for Skulking Killer, but I hope it ends up being worse than a C plus because I'm not going to be happy to face this and get blown out. Next is Sorin, the Mirthless. Four mana Planeswalker starts out at four loyalty and a certainly powerful Planeswalker. The plus one lets us look at the top card of our library. We may reveal that card and put it into our hand and then we lose life equal to its mana value. So if we reveal all lands, we don't lose any life, but uh, can potentially cost a few life points. Then the minus two creates a 2-3 black vampire creature token with flying and lifelink. So great at helping us enable the first plus one ability. And then the minus seven, if we get to it, deals 13 damage to any targets and we gain 13 life. So I imagine for the most part we're going to play Sorin, use the minus, plus, maybe minus again, and then keep on plusing. So it's a powerful card. Uh, let's say the opponent can deal with the vampire token right away. There's a chance we lose Sorin on the spot. So it's not an unassailable Planeswalker. If we compare it to Arlen from the previous set making two tokens right away, Arlen's a little bit easier to protect. Although the, the vampire tokens here are certainly more powerful than a 2-2 wolf. So, Soren's powerful. Don't think it quite reaches S tier category, but who cares, we're first picking this if we open it. So it gets an easy A bomb level. Next is Toxril, the corrosive, a 7 mana, mythic rare, legendary slug horror. It's a 7-7, saying at the beginning of each end step, Put a slime counter on each creature you don't control, and creatures you don't control get minus one, minus one for each slime counter on them. Alright, so the fact that this triggers on end step is quite powerful, meaning we essentially kill all one toughness creatures from the opponent right away the turn we play Toxril if they can't counter or remove it at instant speed. And then it's only going to keep on shrinking the opposing creatures. And uh, yeah, whenever a creature we don't control with a slime counter on it dies, we also get to make a 1-1 one, one black slug creature token. So opponent loses their stuff, we start making more and more tokens, 
And for a blue and a black, we can also sacrifice a slug to draw a card. So Toxrill is very powerful. Now, that being said, let's say we play Toxrill, opponent doesn't have any one toughness creatures. They all get minus one counters, thanks to the slime counter here. But then the opponent does have removal for Toxrill. Once Toxrill is gone, the minus one, minus one stops applying, because they're just slime counters, not minus one, minus one counters. So it's not like the opponent instantly loses to Toxrill the turn we play it, meaning that it's maybe not quite an S, but once again, definitely a bomb, and especially if you're blue-black and can use the ability to draw cards, this is going to be an amazing curve topper. Next is Undead Butler, 2 mana, 1 2 zombie at uncommon. And when the butler enters the battlefield, mill 3 cards. And when the butler dies, you may exile it, and when you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So a nice creature in maybe an exploit deck, or pretty much any deck is going to be happy with a butler, can uh, mill some powerful creatures to eventually get back. And uh, yeah, you don't have to pay any additional mana to uh, get that creature back once the butler dies. So it fits into multiple archetypes and still a 1-2 that can uh, potentially help you double block early on. So C plus for the butler. Happy to have it in pretty much any black deck. Next up is Undying Malice. One mana instant at common, saying until end of turn, target creature gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on it. So we've seen this type of effect a few times in the past. It's usually okay. Don't have room for a ton of these in most decks. Maybe as a one-off it's okay. So gets a C, playable card. Next is Unhallowed Phalanx. A 5 mana, 113 at common, a zombie soldier, but it enters the battlefield tapped. Pretty big drawback for a creature that wants to be blocking. But 13 toughness means it can potentially attack for 13 if we control that black green on common, or we can deal 13 damage to the opponent if we sacrifice it to the catapult. So it does have some cool synergies going for it. That being said, it's still pretty narrow, and outside of black green, I don't think we're going to be interested in this as a blocker that doesn't even block the turn we play it. So it gets a C, but uh, I'm looking forward to casting this one. Next is Vampire's Kiss. Two mana sorcery at common, dealing or making the opponent lose two life, and we gain two life, and we also make two blood tokens. So quite flavorful. Does maybe have a little bit of synergy in like a black-white life gain deck. Although, for the most part, this is not a card I would be happy to put in my deck. Two mana to drain the opponent for two is not playable. The blood tokens make it a little bit better. Although I'm still skeptical whether or not we would want this in a deck that cares about blood tokens, or a life gain deck for that matter. So, it does a lot of things, but all those things don't necessarily add up to a full card. So I'm leaning towards D, but I'll happily be proven wrong. Next we have Voldaren Bloodcaster. 2 mana for a 2-1 Vampire Wizard at rare, has flying, and when the Bloodcaster or another non-token creature you control dies, create a blood token. So pretty easy for this to make a few of them. And then whenever we create a blood token, if we control 5 or more blood tokens, we transform the Bloodcaster. So by itself it's unlikely to get up to 5 tokens, but combined with other cards that make tokens, we'll pretty easily get there. And then we get a 3-3 Bloodbat Summoner, which holds us flying, and says at the beginning of combat on your turn, up to one target blood token you control becomes a 2-2 Black Bat creature with flying and haste, in addition to its other types. So this is an amazing payoff for the blood tokens. If we can turn them into 2-2 flyers, they will certainly be worth a card. So maybe if you have uh, the Bloodbat Summoner, you'll want to play the Vampire's Kiss as well. But uh, yeah, the 2-mana Bloodcaster is certainly very powerful, and uh, yeah, might even sneak its way up to an A bomb range, since a 2-mana 2-1 flyer is already quite decent, and this has a ton of upside. 
Next is Wedding Security. 5 mana for a 4-4 Vampire Soldier at Uncommon. And when the security attacks, we may sacrifice a blood token. If we do, put a plus one plus one counter on the security and draw a card. So without blood tokens, this card's not playable. With blood tokens, this card's pretty sweet. Attacks as a 5-5, keeps on growing, and drawing a card as opposed to discard and draw is quite the upside. So yeah, I like the wedding security and in a dedicated blood token deck, I think might even get up to a B. First red card is a braid, two mana instant at common dealing three damage to target creature or destroying an artifact. So nice reprint, but reprinted at common as opposed to uncommon. This card was already quite good at uncommon, but downshifted in rarity. So this will probably be the best red common in the set. So we're starting out strong. Destroying artifacts, haven't seen a ton of powerful artifacts, uh, don't usually want to spend two mana to destroy a blood token, but we're mostly here for the three damage to a creature at instant speed, which is great, so an easy B. Next is Alchemist Gambit, three mana sorcery at rare, lets us take an extra turn after this one. During that turn, damage cannot be prevented, and at the beginning of that turn's end step, we lose the game. So not a card we want to cast until we're sure that we can end the game in time. So maybe in like a very aggressive red-white deck with lots of flying creatures, we can eventually cast this to help us end the game out of nowhere. But uh, maybe we want to cast this in a blue-red deck instead, where we can pay its cleave cost of 7 mana, and then we just get to take an extra turn without the drawback of losing the game. So what do we think of Gambit? Definitely not as powerful as, let's say, an Alrun's Epiphany, but maybe it wants to go in a slightly different deck, as I mentioned. Maybe play this in a low-curve aggressive deck, where we can end the game in that extra turn. So in that sense, it's reminiscent of the uh, Chance for Glory, which I don't remember being particularly good and limited, so... Probably mostly looking at this as a 7-mana sorcery to take an extra turn, which seems a little bit too expensive to be great. So I'm somewhat skeptical, but I'll still give it a C out of respect for extra turn cards. Next is Alluring Suitor, a 3 mana, 2 3 vampire at uncommon. Says whenever we attack with exactly 2 creatures, we can tr transform the Suitor into a 3 3 deadly dancer with trample. And when this creature transforms into deadly dancer, we can add double rat to our mana pool. And this doesn't go away as steps and phases end until end of turn. And for double red, the dancer and another target creature each get plus one plus so until end of turn. So what's going to be like a common play pattern? We play like a two mana two two on turn two into suitor, and then turn three or a turn four rather, we can attack, transform into deadly dancer, and then hopefully by pumping or two drop by one. It can still at least trade for whatever the opponent has on defense. So we can set up a profitable attack, transform into Deadly Dancer without throwing away any cards in the process. And yeah, once we get a Deadly Dancer, 3-3 three, three with Trample, with that additional upside, seems pretty decent. So I'm liking the Suitor and uh, might even go up to a B for it, just to curve off to drop into this, especially on the play, seems like it's going to be quite backbreaking for the opponent. Next is Ancestral Anger, one mana sorcery at common. It says target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is one plus the number of cards named Ancestral Anger in your graveyard, and we get to draw a card. So even if you only have one copy of this in your deck, it's still totally fine. Of course, going to shine in the blue-red spells deck. And the card I uh, envision pairing with this nicely is going to be the Storm Chaser Drake. I briefly mentioned the red pump spell for one mana when talking about the Drake, and this seems like the perfect card to combine with it. Target the Drake, draw a card from the Drake, draw a card from the Anger. Maybe find more copies of Ancestral Anger to kind of combo off. So yeah, great little card, good in pretty much any red deck that has a sufficient number of creatures, 
and it's going to shine in the blue red spells archetype the most so c plus for ancestral anger get as many of these as you can get next is ballista watcher four mana four three human soldier werewolf add on common this is the daybound side of it and for two in a red we can tap the watcher to deal one damage to any target so pinger a little bit expensive at uh, three mana to activate but uh yeah dealing one damage to any target can take out small creatures finish off a creature that's already dealt damage cannot be underestimated how powerful that is and then on the nightbound side turns into ballista wielder which is a 5-5 five five with that same ability except it doesn't need to tap so just three mana to deal one damage to any target so if we have six mana we can potentially use it twice and the creature dealt damage this way it cannot block this turn so even if we're not killing a creature we can still prevent them from blocking so it seems like a very difficult card to deal with once it transforms and the opponent has like two activations of this you're basically not going to be able to block anymore and also interesting to note is that the watcher kind of enables itself to transform into the ballista wielder because you can just pass the turn and then you can still spend your mana in a useful way either with the watcher's ability or with a wielder's ability in the opponent's turn so it's great at uh, letting it transform to nighttime thanks to the activated ability so yeah i'm a fan of it i'll give this a b next is belligerent guest three mana three two vampire at common with trample and when it deals combat damage to a player we create a blood token so yeah fine common three drop not always gonna make a blood token but even if it trades it might still trample over for one and leave behind a blood token in the process so playable card gets a c then we have blood hypnotist three mana three three vampire at uncommon cannot block so that's a pretty big downside for most creatures says whenever we sacrifice one or more blood tokens target creature cannot block this turn only triggers once each turn so only goes into the most aggressive black red vampire decks presumably how do we feel about hypnotist we really need other ways of sacrificing blood tokens other than just using the activated ability otherwise it's probably going to be too slow but like a curve of two drop into like a blood hypnotist into the four mana blood crazed uh, socialite for instance that's the three three that can get plus two plus two by sacrificing a token and makes one when it enters that's the type of curve that's going to make it impossible for the opponent to block and uh, probably difficult to race as well so there's definitely a home for hypnotist but you just need to make sure your deck is aggressive enough so overall i land on c for hypnotist not every red deck is going to want it but could be okay under the right circumstances a blood petal celebrant is a two mana two one vampire at common has first strike as long as it's attacking and when the celebrant dies we make a blood token as well so fine two drop gonna be good paired with other pump spells perhaps or burn spells to finish off larger creatures so fine card gets a c a bloody betrayal is the act of treason variant of the set so gain control of opposing creature untap it gains haste until end of turn create a blood token could technically also target your own creature with it just to give it haste but uh, usually reserved for stealing opposing creatures the blood tokens a nice upside do we play this in your average black red vampire deck i don't think there's enough sacrifice outlets to really justify it and despite the added blood token i don't think that's reason enough to want to main deck this reliably so probably still a uh, d for bloody betrayal but uh yeah maybe if you've got enough sacrifice outlets this becomes an interesting card to include next is cemetery gatekeeper part of the cemetery cycle at mythic two mana two one vampire with first strike when it enters a battlefield exile a card from any graveyard and whenever a player plays a land or casts a spell if it shares a card type with the exiled card gatekeeper deals two damage to that player so unlikely to exile a land with a gatekeeper early on 
Maybe can snipe like an early creature that traded off. Can also be effective against opposing disturb cards. And then dealing two damage to the opponent whenever they cast a creature is quite punishing. And at the same time, a two mana two on first strike is a perfectly fine creature to play on turn two, even if maybe the ability won't be all that useful then. So it's a decent card early, and late game could also deal quite a bit of damage. So card seems great, definitely better than uh, Thalia in white, so probably gets it up to a B range. I guess it also is a card that's symmetrical, so it also deals damage to us. But hopefully if you're a red deck, you care more about dealing damage to the opponent than taking damage yourself. Next is Chandra, Dressed to Kill. Three mana Planeswalker starts out at three loyalty. The plus one adds red to her mana pool, and then Chandra deals one damage to up to one target player or Planeswalker. So it can help us ramp. The second plus one exiles the top card of our library. If it's red, we may cast it this turn. So the problem with that second plus one is you're rarely going to have a mono red deck in limited. So let's say you're a two color deck with an even split between red and your secondary color. Then already half of your cards more or less are going to be lands. And then once again, you have to divide it by half until you're left with all the red cards. So the second plus ones in the average deck is just not super likely to provide card advantage, which that's kind of the ability that's the the most powerful ability on Chandra and the reason to play her. So yeah, once the second ability is no longer exciting, the entire card kind of starts losing its luster a little bit. If we somehow get to seven mana, we can ultimate, exiling the top five cards of our library, and then we may cast red spells from among them this turn, getting an emblem saying whenever we cast a red spell, this emblem deals X damage to any target, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell. But yeah, getting to the ultimate is going to be a pretty big hurdle to overcome. So not a huge fan of Chandra. Um, might be okay in a deck that just wants to use Chandra as a ramp card but it's not the most reliable ramp cards, and there's other three mana options available that aren't easily removed. So, great card for Constructed, no doubt, but for Limited, actually a bit of a disappointment, much like Kaya. So that's probably a good thing, Planeswalkers that have Constructed applications that don't necessarily ruin games of Limited. So Chandra gets a C. Next is Change of Fortune. 4 mana sorcery at rare, discarding our hand, then draw a card for each card we've discarded this turn. So if we don't have some other discard effects happening, this is a pretty underwhelming effect. Now it does say for each card we've discarded this turn, so let's say we sacrificed one or two blood tokens before casting Change of Fortune, then we may end up drawing quite a few extra cards, but that does require a lot of setup and by itself it's still not an exciting card. And if you already have blood tokens, you've got less of a need for this type of effect in the first place since you can loot away your lands anyway. So not a fan of this, but might have some fun constructed applications. Next we have a Creepy Puppeteer, 4 mana for a 4-3 human rogue at rare. This has haste, and when the Puppeteer attacks, if you attacked with exactly one other creature this combat, you may have that creature's base power and toughness become 4-3 until end of turn. So this card seems incredibly backbreaking if you're on the play and you just curve any creature into a Puppeteer on turn 4, and you're attacking for 8. Now luckily for the opponent, I guess, the Puppeteer only has 3 toughness, so a decent number of 3 drops from the opponent can trade for it. So it's only going to be one turn of taking a ton of damage. But uh, yeah, very powerful card, and especially if you can back it up with removal or pump spells, and can consistently keep attacking with it, it will end the game in a hurry. Debating whether or not this falls into the uh, A category of bomb, or if it's closer to a high B grade. Maybe A is pushing it, but Played on curve, this is one of the cards that's going to end the game the fastest. Let's give Puppeteer an A. I think I've convinced myself. 
Next is Curse of Hospitality, 3 mana, Enchantment Aura Curse, meant to enchant the opponent, and then creatures attacking the opponent have Trample, and whenever a creature deals combat damage to the opponent, that player exiles the top card of their library until end of turn, we can cast or play that card rather, so also includes lands. We can play cards exiled and uh, spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. So hospitality can provide a nice bit of card advantage. And uh, yeah, giving our creatures trample is a nice upside. Now spending three mana to not necessarily impact the board could be a problem. So it does probably pair best alongside some evasive creatures, so even in a late game we can still get the extra card advantage with it. Red isn't necessarily known for having a lot of flying creatures, so it's a little bit awkward in that sense, um, but if you can keep consistently hitting the opponent, even if it's just for one damage here and there, then uh, the extra card advantage should help you win the game. So I'll go with a C plus on Curse, has potential, but you do have to work for it. Next is Daybreak Combatants, 3 mana, 2-2 two, two Human Warrior at common, has haste, and when it enters a battlefield, target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So it could be a 4-2 that hits the opponent for 4 and then will be a 2-2 two, two afterwards, but a uh, plus 2 plus 0 can help you maybe grow a creature, make it easier to train one of your other creatures as well, so it could be nice in like a red-white aggro deck. Seems decent. Um, might even go up to a C plus, like a 2-2 a two -two with haste with a very relevant upside. Seems like a great card for an aggressive red deck, and probably red-white, as I've mentioned, gonna be the best home for it. Next is Dominating Vampire. 3 mana, 3-3 three, three Vampire at rare, when it enters a battlefield, you essentially get an Act of Treason effect, getting control of target creature with mana value less than or equal to the number of Vampires you control until end of turn, untap that creature and it gains haste. So a pretty big restriction on what you can steal, if the Dominating Vampire is the only Vampire you control, then uh, you're limited to maybe stealing tokens or 1-drops. So, really wants to go in a vampire heavy deck. Played on curve, probably not that impressive, but when played later, the uh, the act of treason effect of it becomes more powerful, but then we're only casting a 3-3. So, seems okay, but not amazing at the same time. So, I would probably land somewhere on uh, like a C plus for dominating vampire. Certainly nice to have a 3-3 three, three for 3 in red, which is already like decent stats, but for it to really shine you need those vampires. Next is End the Festivities, 1 mana sorcery at common, dealing 1 damage to each opponent and each creature and planeswalker they control. So very narrow card, um, could be an okay sideboard card against a deck with a lot of low toughness creatures, maybe a lot of 1-1 one, one tokens. But typically not a card I would main deck, so it gets a D. Then we have Falcon Wrath, Celebrants, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Vampire at common, has Menace, and when it enters a battlefield we create 2 blood tokens. So 5 mana for a 4-4 four, four Menace is okay, not amazing, but uh, the 2 blood tokens certainly make it a lot better. Being able to loot away land 6 plus, being able to enable various blood synergies in the vampire deck, those are all relevant. Plays well with removal spells, making it more difficult for the opponent to double block. Plays well with pump spells. We'll see a sure strike a little bit later, a great combo with menace creatures like Celebrants. So I'm a fan, and uh, might even bump it up to a C+. Next we have Fearful Villager, 3 mana, 2-3 Human Werewolf at common, has menace. This is the Daybound side, transforms into Fearsome Werewolf, a 4-3 with Menace. So, it looks worse than the Shady Traveler from Midnight Hunt, which I ended up settling on a C grade for it. So this is probably similar, gets a C. Might be slightly better in reds with Menace, but still nothing too exciting. 
Next is Flame Blast Bolt, one mana instant, at common dealing two damage to a creature or planeswalker, and that creature or planeswalker also gets exiled if it would die this turn. So a slightly better Magma Spray, which has always been a, a very good card. The fact that it exiles, incredibly irrelevant in a set with Disturb. So easy C+. I don't think it's quite as good as Abrade, since the difference between 2 damage and 3 damage is relevant, but exiling is certainly a very relevant upside. Next is Frenzy the Devils, 5 mana, 3-3 three, three Devil, at uncommon with haste. Says whenever we cast a non-creature spell, the Devils gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So putting this plus 2 ability on a haste creature is kind of weird, because the turn we play it we're unlikely to be able to play a non-creature spell alongside it. So then it's just a 5 mana 3-3 three, three haste, which is unlikely to have a great attack. But on the following turn it can certainly start doing more damage. It's probably playable, but not amazing. Also, something I mentioned about the blue-red spells deck is it might be able to slot in counter spells a little bit better, because a lot of the payoffs actually just deal damage to the opponent rather than increase a creature's power. The Devils, on the other hand, is a creature that doesn't work very well with counter spells, since you want to be pumping it in your own turn, presumably. So. If you want to pair it with counter spells, it's not great. If you instead want to pair it with, you know, other non-creature spells, it gets a little bit better. But still not super thrilled by it, so C for Frenzy Devils. Next is Honeymoon Hearse, a 3-mana 5-5 five five vehicle artifact and uncommon. It tramples, and it doesn't have a, a usual crew cost. Instead, we tap two untapped creatures we control. And then the hearse turns into an artifact creature until end of turn. So it's like you're putting two creatures in the hearse. They're getting married. So pretty fun, flavorful card. And uh, I think also pretty powerful in terms of power level. Especially in a more low-curve deck that has some cheaper creatures that can maybe no longer attack profitably. But you can still at least crew the hearse and 5-5 uh, five, five trample can certainly do quite a bit of damage. So, overall, hers gets a B grade from me. Next is the Hungry Ridge Wolf. 2 mana, 2-2 two, two wolf at, at uh, common. And as long as we control another wolf or werewolf, the Ridge Wolf gets plus 1 plus 0 and has Trample. So, pretty easy for this to be a 3-2 Trampler in red-green, which has the highest density of wolves and werewolves. So, seems like a great 2-drop for that deck. Outside of red-green, probably not amazing, but still gonna give it a C+. Next is the Ill-Tempered Loner. 4 mana for a 3-3 human werewolf at rare. And when a loner is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any target. So an ability we've definitely seen before in the past is quite powerful. Doesn't necessarily look amazing, but in practice, if you're like in a racing situation, the opponent will have to think twice about attacking with her 6-6 into the loner. And then for one and a red, the loner gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So not too difficult to use this multiple times in the same turn. This is a daybound sign of it. And then transforms into Howl Pack Avenger, a 4-4, saying whenever any permanent we control is dealt damage, the Avenger deals that much damage to any target. So all of a sudden this applies to all our creatures which is quite the upgrade, and then for 2 mana gets plus 2 plus 0. So a very solid card, especially if it transforms. On the front side, you know, it's powerful but still manageable. On the Nightbound side, it seems almost impossible for the opponent to realistically race this if you both have a couple creatures out. So, yeah, Avenger might uh, sneak into the uh, A category, certainly a bomb level card. Next is Into the Night, 4 mana sorcery at uncommon. Says it becomes knight, so we'll play well in like a red-green werewolf deck. And then discard any number of cards, and then draw that many cards plus 1. So, while there are blood tokens to kind of achieve the same effect, red-green 
isn't necessarily going to have as many ways to generate those blood tokens as other color pairs. So in that sense, this ability is not as redundant as it may appear at first glance. But that being said, I'm still not super interested in this effect in general. Four mana seems a little bit pricey, so you really need to value your uh, nightbound sides for this to be worth it, I feel. So not very high on uh, Into the Night, I'll give it a D, but I could see some uh, werewolf decks still wanting to play this because they badly want to switch it to nighttime. Next is Kassig, Flame Breather, 2 mana, 1 3 human shaman at common. Says whenever you cast a non creature spell, the Flame Breather deals 1 damage to each opponent. This could pair well with counter spells as well, since you can still just uh, play defense with it, counter something in the opponent's turn, deal some extra damage. So it does pair a little bit better with counter spells, but of course, still going to be overall at its best in blue red where we care the most about dealing damage through non-creature spells. Still probably just a C for Classic Flame Breather, fine card, but doesn't go into a ton of different decks. Next is Classic Wolf Rider, one mana for a 1-2 Human Knight at rare, has Menace, so it can maybe get in a few points of damage in early, and then for two in a red we can tap it, exiling three cards from our graveyard to create a 3-2 Red Wolf Creature token. So, pretty intriguing card. A 1-2 can deal a few points of damage early, and then late game, if uh, the graveyards start filling up, can eventually generate an army of wolf tokens. So, yeah, it's uh, an okay card early, and then late game still has some utility, which, you know, that's a lot to ask for a 1-drop at the end of the day. So, seems like an above-average card, C+. Lacerate Flash, 5 mana sorcery at common dealing 4 damage to a creature, and then we create a number of blood tokens equal to the amount of excess damage dealt to that creature this way. So if we're killing a 4 toughness creature we don't get any blood tokens, but maybe we're killing like a 2-2 a flyer and we get 2 blood tokens afterwards, so a nice little upside to a 4 damage sorcery speed removal spell. So not incredibly efficient, but still a card you'll probably be happy to have at least a few copies of in your red decks, especially if you also have some synergies with those blood tokens. But uh, yeah, C plus for Lacerate Flesh. Lampholt Raconteur is a 4 mana, 2 4 human werewolf at uncommon. It says whenever you cast a non creature spell, it deals 1 damage to each opponent. So similar to the Flame Breather we just covered. And then transforms into Lamphold Ravager on the Nightbound side. And whenever we cast an non-creature spell, now deals 2 damage to each opponent instead, and is a 4-4 instead of a 2-4. So this card is great alongside other instants, even counter spells, as I mentioned a few times now. So can just kind of sit there, pass a turn, get a 4-4, counter the opponent's stuff while dealing 2 damage each time, which starts to add up very quickly. So this will be an awesome card for the blue-red spells deck, and uh, I think deserves a B grade. Next is Lightning Wolf, 4 mana, 4-3 four, wolf at common, and for 1 and a red, gains a first strike until end of turn, but can only be used at sorcery speed. So, a pretty big drawback of only being able to use it at sorcery speed as we kind of lose the threat of activation in a way. We have to pay the mana up front. 4-3 for 4. Reasonable stats, still not exciting, can sometimes just trade for an opposing 3-drop. So yeah, having to pay the mana up front, not being able to activate it on defense, makes it a lot weaker than it would be otherwise. So not very high on Lightning Wolf, but Probably still a fine curve filler and a wolf for potential wolf synergies, so it gets a C. Next is Magma Pommeler. This one's pretty tricky to evaluate. X and double red for an elemental at uncommon. It's a 0 0, but enters a battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And then if damage would be dealt to Magma Pommeler while it has a plus 1 counter on it, Prevent the damage and remove that many plus one counters from it, 
And when one or more counters are removed, we get to deal that much damage to any target. So, yeah, bit of a weird card. Of course, great in the late game once we have a lot of mana. Although, that being said, especially red has access to a lot of blood tokens. So, instead of playing out land 7, we're probably more interested in looting it away with our blood tokens instead. Making a card like Magma Pummeler less desirable or powerful in the late game than it would be otherwise. But yeah, if you've got a lot of mana, you can play this out. And then if the opponent tries to trump it, they're still, you know, taking some damage over time. And uh, can deal damage to any target, so we can also take out creatures with it. So it's going to be a difficult card to both play with and against. Uh, the overall rating I'm not very confident on. Again, powerful and late game play, but uh, not very good if you need to play it for like X equals 2 or 3. So Magma Pummeler, I think I'm going to end up giving like a C plus a fine card, but uh, yeah, better if you can maybe ramp it out in a red-green deck that has access to more mana. Next we have a mana form, Hellkite, 4 mana, 4-4 four, four dragon at mythic, it flies, and says whenever we cast a non-creature spell, create an XX red dragon illusion creature token with flying and haste, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast it, and we exile that token at the beginning of the next end step. So for most intents and purposes, it's like dealing damage to the opponents equal to that spell's mana value. Uh, assuming we're casting it in our turn as opposed to the opponent's turn. And yeah, 4 mana, 4 for flyer, also just deals a lot of damage by itself. So it seems like a powerful bomb level card, which will be at its best in like a blue-red spells deck, but any red deck is going to be happy to have the Hellkite. So bomb level card gets an A. Next is a Markov Retribution, 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, letting us choose one or both, giving our creatures plus one plus so until end of turn, and target vampire we control deals damage equal to its power to another target creature. So outside of a vampire's deck, this is not exciting. Three mana to give our creatures plus one plus so until end of turn is like a worse trumpet blast, not a very good card. But if we're playing a vampire deck, then both pumping the team and being able to remove something is nice. Now, it is a sorcery, so the opponent will see the extra power coming, as well as potentially being able to remove the target vampire in response. Probably going to be limited to black-red vampire decks. Don't think this is going to be making its way into a lot of red-white aggro decks necessarily. Yeah, has potential. I'll give it a C just to start out, but uh, this is a card I'll have to play with to get a better feel for it. Next is Olivia's Attendance, 6 mana, 6-6 six, six, Vampire at Rare with Menace. So, pretty difficult to block. When it deals damage, create that many blood tokens. So if this gets one clean attack in, deal 6, we get to make 6 blood tokens, which will easily enable lots of your other Vampire cards or help you draw through the deck. And then for 2 in a red, the attendants also can deal 1 damage to any target, even if we deal damage to creatures with either the activated ability or just by dealing damage. We get to make uh, blood tokens as well. So yeah, unless the opponent can remove the attendants right away, it's gonna leave behind some blood, and uh, that seems incredibly powerful. So bomb level card, Olivia's attendants gets an A. Next is Pyre Spawn, 6 mana, 6-4 six elemental at common. When it dies, it deals 3 damage to any target. So 6-4, a little bit uh, weak for 6 mana, but it does deal 3 on the way out. So under most circumstances, if the opponent kills it, we'll at least still get something out of it, unless the opponent can like exile it or put some other enchantment on it. So, not a huge fan of the Pyre Spawn. It's probably like a fine curve topper if you don't have anything expensive. But as I've said a few times, if you have a lot of ways to generate blood tokens, you're also less interested in playing a lot of expensive cards, because you would rather just 
discard a lot of your lands in the late game. So I think D for power spawn, but I'm sure we'll still make its way into a couple decks just as a curve topper. And then we've got a Reckless Impulse, 2 mana sorcery at common, exiling the top 2 cards of your library, and until the end of your next turn you may play those cards. So that also includes playing lands. So it has the potential to be a 2 for 1, but not a card you typically want to play on turn 2, since that's going to make it more difficult to get full value out of it. So seems like a fine playable card, especially for like a blue-red spells deck that can uh, make the best use of casting lots of non-creature spells. So I'll give this a C for Reckless Impulse, but uh, yeah, an interesting take on card draw. Then we've got Rending Flame, a 3 mana instant speed, removal spell at uncommon, dealing 5 damage to target creature or planeswalker, and if that permanent is a spirit, a Rending Flame also deals 2 damage to that permanent's controller. So even without the extra spirit flavor text, this would be great, but that just makes it even better. So easy B for Rending Flame, awesome removal spell. Runebound Wolf, a 2 mana 2-2 two -two wolf and uncommon, for 4 mana we can tap it, and then the wolf deals damage equal to the number of wolves and werewolves we control to target opponent. So yeah, fine to drop to play early, and then when the board stalls out, can still deal damage to the opponent. So gonna be awesome in like a red-green werewolf deck. So C plus for runebound wolf. Next is Sanguine Statuette, 2 mana artifact at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, create a blood token. And whenever you sacrifice a blood token, you may have it turn into a 3-3 vampire artifact creature with haste until end of turn. So seems decent in a dedicated black-red vampire deck that has other ways of sacrificing tokens besides having to just pay the 1 mana. Because if we have to pay the 1 mana, that's going to slow down our aggressive game plan. But if we're playing Statuette into like a 3 mana vampire into, I've mentioned it a few times, the uh, Blood Crazed Socialite on turn 4, which can sacrifice blood tokens to give it plus 2, plus 2 and menace. That's the type of curve where the Statuette could deal quite a bit of damage over time, especially if we have other ways of making blood tokens to keep up the supply. So C plus for Statuette will be pretty decent in the Vampire archetype. Then we've got Stensia Uprising, a 4-mana enchantment at rare, saying at the beginning of your end step, create a 1-1 red human creature token. Then if you control exactly 13 permanents, you may sacrifice Uprising, and when you do, it deals 7 damage to any target. So getting to 13 permanents, not impossible. Let's say we play Uprising turn 4, around maybe turn 7... We have seven lands, we made a couple tokens, we might have some creatures in play. That's around the earliest we can sacrifice it. But even just making a 1-1 token every turn, this seems okay. A little bit slow to get going, but over time it will certainly prove its worth. So I think I like B for Uprising. I'm kind of a sucker for these enchantments that make tokens, so might be overrating it slightly, but seems fun. Then we've got Sure Strike, reprinted many times, and it's one of the best combo tricks you can get at 2 mana, giving target creature plus 3 plus 0 and first strike until end of turn. So pairs amazingly well with menace creatures, Potent tries to double block your 5-5 five five menace, and uh, you've got a Sure Strike, kill both creatures, that's where the Sure Strike shines. Just gotta be careful to make sure the opponent's tapped out and can't kill your creature in response. But uh, yeah. I usually stick to giving combo tricks a C rating, but Sure Strike might even sneak its way into the C+, if your deck is aggressive enough with lots of menace creatures. And then Vampire's Vengeance is a 3 mana instant at uncommon, dealing 2 damage to each non-vampire creature, and create a blood token. So this is an important card to keep in mind when playing against any red deck, specifically vampire decks, as kind of a cheap sweeper. Um, yeah, seems okay. Um, in a dedicated vampire deck, of course, going to be much better when it doesn't risk killing your own stuff. 
but uh, has potential. So combined with first strike creatures or author uh, burn spells can maybe take out something a bit larger. But also, of course, has a drawback that sometimes the opponent will be playing vampires as well. So overall, probably still just give this a C, but has a lot of potential and certainly a card I'll mention when playing games. Like if my opponent has a vampire's vengeance here, we're going to be in trouble. But then again, it's not always going to be that easy. Next, we have a volatile arsonist, a five mana mythic rare human werewolf. It's a 4-4 with Menace and Haste, so it can get in there right away. And when it attacks, it deals 1 damage to each of up to 1 target creature, up to 1 target player, and or up to 1 target Planeswalker. Seems amazing, can take out some low toughness creatures. Menace makes it difficult to block the turn it comes into play and attacks right away. And this is only the Daybound side, once it transforms to Night, turns into the Dire Strain Anarchist. A 5-5 werewolf with menace and haste, and when it attacks it deals 2 damage to each of those targets instead. So we'll completely decimate the opponent's board. So this card seems amazing, easily a bomb level card, gets an A. Then we've got the Voldaren Epicure, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one vampire. When it enters a battlefield deals 1 damage to each opponent, and we create a blood token. A reasonable card if you care about getting those blood tokens. Dealing one damage is just random upside, although we don't have the same need for dealing damage to the opponent to enable our vampire synergies this time around. And uh, yeah, just a fine curve filler if you're an aggressive vampire deck, but still a pretty low impact card overall, so can give it more than a D. And then Voltaic Visionary, two mana for a 3-1 human wizard at uncommon can tap it and deal 2 damage to ourselves, but then we get to exile the top card of our library, and we may play that card this turn. That also includes lands. Can only use it as a sorcery, and if we play a card exiled with the visionary, we can transform it into Volt Charged Berserker, which is a 4-3 that cannot block. So, bit of a strange card, but at the end of the day, if we play visionary on turn 2, Assuming we're playing a low curve deck where we can cast most spells or lands we exile with a visionary on turn 2, or turn 3 rather, then uh, we could transform it by turn 3, deals a bit of damage to us, provided hopefully a card of card advantage, and then we get a 4-3 that cannot block, but at least it's not forced to attack, so only have to attack with it if it lines up favorably. So, a bit of a, a tricky card to evaluate but overall feels like it's still an above average card. So give this a C plus. Yeah, the major problem is the turn we activate Visionary to transform it, it's going to be tapped, so it's not going to attack on turn three. So we'll have to wait a few turns before the Berserker can actually get in there. Then we've got Weary Prisoner, four mana, two six, human werewolf at common, has Defender, and uh, that's the daybound side, so pretty good blocker. And then once it does transform to night, turns into the wrathful jailbreaker six six. Of course, loses defender and now attacks each combat if able instead. So quite the difference between the daybound side and nightbound side. Hopefully you're uh, okay with attacking if it transforms to nighttime, and you don't need that creature on defense. But a 6-6 six, six certainly hits hard, can make a few comparisons to the Ruffian from Midnight Hunt, the 4-mana werewolf that also became quite large on the Nightbound side. Overall that card was okay, not exciting, so I would probably put this in a similar category. So I think I'm just giving this a C instead of anything more, but certainly a card with a lot of potential in like a red-green werewolf deck especially if you've got a few ways of giving a trample. First green card, Apprentice Sharpshooter, 3 mana, 1 for Human Archer at common, has Reach and Training. So this is your anti-flying creature. Training means we can maybe get an attack in early on alongside a 2 or 3 powered creature, and get this up to a 2-5, a 
And a 2-5 certainly blocks many more flyers profitably than a 1-4 does, which maybe only discourages a couple attacks. Getting that initial attack in is going to kind of make or break the sharpshooter. If the opponent has good blocks available to like double block your sharpshooter or maybe kill the creature for free that you're attacking with alongside the sharpshooter to grow it in the first place, then things aren't going to end well for you. But hopefully you can back it up with like a pump spell so you can safely get it up to a 2-5 and then a 2-5 for 3 with reach is definitely pretty good stats and yeah it doesn't have to sit back to play defense if you can keep growing it thanks to training it can just deal a lot of damage over time so there's a lot to like about the sharpshooter the major hurdle is going to be to get that uh, first counter on it so it can actually attack and block a bit better so i think i'm still gonna end on a c for the sharpshooter a fine card but it does require a little bit of work to really get it going then we've got Ascendant Pack Leader, a 2-1 Wolf at rare, and uh, yeah, seems like a great 1-drop for Constructed. When it enters a battlefield, it enters with a plus 1 counter on it if you control a permanent with mana value 4 or greater. So in the late game, hopefully it's at least a 3-2 instead of a 2-1. And whenever you cast a spell with mana value 4 or greater, we can also put a plus 1 counter on it, so it will kind of naturally grow over time. So as far as one drops are concerned, this one seems great. And uh, yeah, might even go up to a B grade for the Ascendant Pack Leader. Amazing turn one, and then still scales reasonably well into the late game. Then we've got Avabrook, Caretaker, and I kind of shake my head internally when reading this card. A six mana, four four human werewolf at Mythic. And it has Hexproof. I know, I know. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, put two plus one plus one counters on another target creature you control. So if this resolves, it will eventually take over the game. And this is just a daybound side. Once it turns to night, we get the Hollow Henge Huntmaster, a 6 6 werewolf with Hexproof. And why not? Other permanents you control also have Hexproof. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. Yeah, this card's pretty disgusting. Gets an S, and I don't really want to talk about it anymore. Bramble Armor returns, two mana equipment. Wasn't very good in Midnight Hunt, I doubt it's going to be much different here. So I'll give it a D and move on. Bramble Worm, 7 mana, 7-6 seven, Worm at Uncommon, has Reach and Trample. When it enters battlefield, you gain 5 life, and if it happens to be in our graveyard, we can exile it for 2 and a green to gain 5 life. So it will be pretty nice in like a blue-green ramp deck that has a bit of self-mill, so if we get to 7 mana, we can cast it. If we happen to mill it, we can just use it to gain 5. And uh, yeah, 7-6. Seven, Reach also a nice keyword to have, so you don't lose to random flyers. And uh, Trample, so no chum blocking allowed. Card seems pretty decent. So B for Brambleworm. Next is Cartographer's Survey, 4 mana sorcery at Uncommon. Let's just take a look at the top 7 cards of our library, putting two up to 2 land cards, I should say, from among them onto the battlefield tapped, and the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. So in a, an average limited deck with 17 lands, we're definitely favorites to find at least two lands. There will be times when you only find one, which is going to be pretty sad, but in most circumstances, four mana to find two lands. So a decent ramp card for kind of the blue-green archetype. Probably not too many other decks were, were interested in this, maybe like a red-green werewolf deck, but that deck usually has a lot of four mana creatures to cast and doesn't necessarily go up to six or seven mana. So yeah, mostly just a blue-green ramp card, but uh, could set up some pretty sweet decks, maybe even helps you splash a third color, despite not actually uh, searching for anything, could still help with uh, splashing a third color. So overall, not an incredibly high pick, I don't think. But uh, I'll give Cartographer's Survey a C. Could lead to some fun decks. 
Next up we've got Cemetery Prowler, 3 mana, 3 for Wolf at Mythic, part of the Cemetery Cycle. Has Vigilance, and when the Prowler enters a battlefield or attacks, we can exile a card from a graveyard. And spells we cast cost 1 generic mana, less to cast for each card type they share with cards exiled with Cemetery Prowler. So 3-4, Vigilance for 3, that makes our spells cheaper, mostly gonna be creature spells that get cheaper. So perfect for like a red-green werewolf deck. Yeah, this card seems very good. Doesn't necessarily have that late game inevitability that some of the other cemetery cards provide, but when played on curve, this will certainly improve your chances of winning significantly. So I'll give this a B, but uh, also a card that will most likely see quite a bit of constructed play. Next is Cloaked Cadets, 5 mana, 2 for human ranger at uncommon, has training, and whenever one or more plus one counters are put on one or more humans you control, get to draw a card. This ability only triggers once each turn. So I should be excited about drawing cards. 5 mana is kind of the problem here. 5 mana for 2 4 is pretty expensive. Now that being said, if it attacks, hopefully alongside like a 3 powered creature at least that doesn't easily die in combat, this will grow up to a 3-5 and then uh, draw a card. So a 3-5, not the easiest to necessarily block and kill for the opponent. So it does have potential. Of course, going to be at its best in a deck that can enable training the turn we play the Cadet on a different training creature then. So we can draw a card immediately and get some nice value. So yeah, in a green-white training deck, this might be an okay curve topper. But I'm um, less excited about it than I probably should be, so I'll give this a C. Crawling Infestation is 3 mana for an enchantment at uncommon, saying at the beginning of your upkeep you may mill 2 cards. So it's a may ability, so we don't risk decking ourselves if it gets down to it. And whenever one or more creature cards are put into our graveyard from anywhere during our turn, we create a 1-1 one, one green insect creature token, only triggers once each turn. So even if a creature dies without necessarily milling it, we might make that insect token. So yeah, presumably this is okay in like a, a blue-green self-mill deck that cares about filling its graveyard. Although in all honesty, we haven't seen a ton of amazing payoff cards for the blue-green self-mill deck. There were, I guess, the uh, the frog at rare in blue-green, and then there's a spider that can maybe make a few tokens. And then in blue there's the Disturb cards, which synergize well, but we have yet to see a ton of other amazing payoffs. So I'm kind of questioning how important it actually is to have all these self-mill enablers. So yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical on this infestation. I'll give it a C to start out, but could maybe lead to some fun self-mill decks. Part of the problem also is that we've seen a ton of cards in the set that exile cards from graveyards. Of course, a lot of them are at higher rarities, so you won't necessarily see them in an average game of limited. But it's gonna feel bad if you finally get some value with infestation by milling like a disturb card just for the opponent to exile it right away. Then we've got Crushing Canopy, reprinted, can destroy a creature with flying or an enchantment at instant speed, so yeah, fine sideboard card, typically not a card that you want to main deck, gets a D. Next is Cultivator Colossus, 7 mana for a mythic rare plant beast with trample, and its power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands we control. So assuming no other ramp cards, this is essentially a 7 mana, 7-7 seven, seven trampler. But then this next part has me a little bit confused. When a Colossus enters a battlefield, we may put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield tapped, and if we do, we draw a card and repeat this process. Now how likely are we to still have a land in hand when we already need to get to 7 to cast the Colossus in the first place? Feels pretty unlikely, so either we're waiting with uh, the Colossus in hand not casting it just to try and get value from the ability, or we cast it and it's just like a 7 mana 7-7 seven, seven trampler with no extra abilities. So I'm kind of disappointed with the Colossus to be fair. 
It's just a big trampler that's kind of difficult to get a lot of value from the ETB effect. So I think it's just going to get a C at the end of the day. Big creature will probably do okay for you if it doesn't get removed, but doesn't necessarily have any ETB value if you cast it as soon as you can. Next is Dawnheart Disciple, 2 mana, 2 2 human warlock at common. And whenever another human enters a battlefield under our control, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Yeah, fine two drop with slight upside will be at its best in the green white human aggro deck. Gets a C. A dig up, one mana sorcery at rare. Can search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it into our hand. Or we can cast it for its cleave cost of 4 mana, in which case we can search any card and don't even have to show it to the opponent. So earlier when talking about the 3 mana tutor at rare in black, I said uh, I'm not a fan of these tutor effects. They're usually overpriced, kind of slow. Now dig up is a little different thanks to its cleave costs. We're sometimes just going to cast it for 1 mana can help us fix our mana base as well if we're splashing, so it does have that utility. And then late game, if we're flooding out a bit and we don't need a land anymore, it does have that additional utility of also being a 4 mana tutor. So the base mode for this is probably just 1 mana, but with a random upside of sometimes being a 4 mana tutor effect late game. I think it's a playable card, still not thrilled about it, but Probably like a C plus, willing to give this a shot, especially if we need it for mana fixing. Next is Dormant Grove, four mana enchantment at uncommon, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Then if that creature has toughness six or greater, transform Dormant Grove into the Gnarled Grove Strider, a three six tree folk with vigilance saying other creatures you control also have Vigilance. So it's a bit slow to eventually transform it, but it can provide a lot of value over time, and we're not forced to transform it, which is the fun part about it. We can just keep on using the enchantments to get more plus one counters, if that's what we prefer. And uh, of course we'll play well in the black-green Toughness Matters deck as a 3-6 with Vigilance, if we combine it with like the Black Green Uncommon could deal 6 damage and still play defense for us. So, seems okay. A little bit slow, but uh, overall I think I'm a fan, especially if we can combine it with enough uh, early blockers so that playing a 4-man enchantment doesn't uh, hurt us too badly. The fact also that it triggers at the beginning of combat as opposed to beginning of upkeep means we can at least get a plus 1 counter from it right away. So I'll give Dormant Grove a C+. Then we've got Flourishing Hunter, 6 mana, 6-6, six, six, Wolf Spirit at common. And when it enters a battlefield, we gain life equal to the greatest toughness among other creatures we control. So we'll shine in black-green. Imagine playing this alongside the Phalanx and gaining 13 life. That sounds pretty fun. So by itself doesn't necessarily gain life it's, if it's the only creature we play. But uh, hopefully we can uh, gain some nice life points. And historically, 6 mana, 6-6 six, six creatures that gain life when they enter have been, I would say, overperformers. Just helping us stay alive against um, the more aggressive decks can help in a racing situation. So I'm willing to give the Hunter a C plus to start out, just to kind of give it... A relatively high grade and then we can always adjust it if it ends up underperforming but uh yeah watch out for it especially in black green glorious sunrise five mana enchantments at rare and we get a ton of versatility here at the beginning of combat on our turn either creatures we control get plus one plus one and trample until end of turn target land gains the ability to tap for triple green until end of turn essentially ramping us for two we can draw a card if we control a creature with power 3 or greater, or we can gain 3 life. So all these abilities are useful. Of course we are paying 5 mana for it, and the turn we play it, it's not always going to have a very high impact on the game, but 
definitely a fun card that if it sticks around to provide value over time, it will uh, definitely help us win the game. And uh, the flexibility is nice. If we're getting attacked by a flyer, can just use it to gain life. If we need some trample, it can provide that, can help us ramp into even bigger stuff. And of course, drawing cards. Who doesn't love drawing cards? So yeah, Sunrise seems playable. Just got to be careful not to, you know, play this first chance you get. If you can help stabilize the board first and then maybe use Sunrise afterwards to pull you ahead. So this is probably one of the last cards you want to play unless you're desperate for like the ramp ability to help you get to some more expensive cards. Next we have Hamlet Vanguard, 3 mana Human Warrior at rare, is a 1-1 one -one with Ward 2, but when it enters a battlefield, it enters with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it for each other non-token human you control. Unlikely that we can play this as a 3 mana 5-5 five five on turn 3, since there's not that many 1 mana humans running around. But uh, yeah, if we have Vanguard in the deck, all 1 mana humans go up in value, and then there's a healthy amount of 2 mana humans, so you can curve 2 drop into Vanguard and have it be at least a 3-3. Three, three. And then late game, it could also become much bigger than that. So gonna be quite good in the green-white training deck that cares about having large creatures to enable training, as well as some minor plus one counter synergies. So Vanguard gets at least a B. Then we've got Hive Heart Shaman. This one's pretty weird. A four mana, three five, and rare. It's a human shaman. And when it attacks, we may search our library for a basic land card that doesn't share a land type with a land we control. So it cannot get a forest, probably, but uh, can help us fix for potential splash colors. And if we're playing the shaman, it also kind of incentivizes us to have a random array of uh, basic lands from other colors, even if we don't necessarily need them to cast our spells. And then we can put that land onto the battlefield. And for 6 mana, we can create a 1-1 one, one green insect creature token and put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the number of basic land types among lands we control. It can only be used at sorcery speed. So if we have all 5 basic lands in play, it's 6 mana to make a 6-6 six, six token. That's quite powerful. But of course, most decks aren't going to be able to afford to have all those basic lands in it. But uh, yeah, this is certainly... A nice incentive to uh, put a random bunch of basic lands in your deck. So, fun card, 4 mana 3 5 is not horrible stats, and it doesn't take much for this to provide even more value. So, a fun build around challenge gets a B. Next is Hook Hands, a Mariner, 4 mana 4 4 Human Werewolf at common. Pretty straightforward, this is a daybound side. Transforms into Rip Hook Raider, a 6 4 that cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So, quite powerful on the Nightbound side. And uh, 4 mana 4 4 is still totally serviceable. So, seems like a very strong common gets a C. Howling Moon is a 3 mana rare enchantment, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, target wolf or werewolf you control gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So it can pump up one of your creatures if you're hopefully the red-green werewolf deck. And whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, we get to make a 2-2 green wolf creature token. So this pairs very nicely alongside your daybound, nightbound werewolves, as it sort of punishes the opponent for switching it back to nighttime by casting two spells, as you'll get a 2-2 token in return. So yeah, in the werewolf deck, this seems pretty good outside of it. Not really interested since it's pretty easy for the put on to play around. So I'll give it a C. Howlpack Piper is 4 mana for a 2 2 human werewolf at rare. Cannot be countered. And for 1 on a green, we can tap it to put a creature card from our hand onto the battlefield. And if it's a wolf or werewolf, we can untap the Piper and uh, yeah, potentially use it once again, but can only be used at sorcery speed. So pretty interesting take on kind of the Elvish Piper. And this is just a daybound side. Once it transforms to night, 
which we can pretty easily accomplish by just activating the creature instead of casting one. Then we get a 4-4 Wild Song Howler and says whenever this creature enters a battlefield or transforms into the Wild Song Howler, we can look at the top 6 cards of our library and we may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into our hand and the rest goes on the bottom. So it can provide a nice bit of card advantage if it transforms and can potentially transform it multiple times and then the ability will help us potentially put more creatures in play so yeah has some pretty cool synergy with itself but for it to truly shine we need to make sure that we've got some like five or six mana creatures to cheat and play with it so overall gets a b then infestation expert is a five mana three four human werewolf and uncommon and when it enters a battlefield or attacks, we get to make a 1-1 one, one, a green insect creature token and transforms into infested werewolf a 4-5 that when it enters a battlefield or attacks creates two 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens instead. So very nice way to go wide and make a whole army of insects. So yeah, pretty decent card all around. Um, a 3 4 4 5 definitely below the curve so ideally you've got additional ways to make it bigger or help you get in for damage to keep making those insects but once it transforms to a 4 5 you're probably going to have an easier time attacking with it so also gets a b then we've got late to rest four mana enchantment at uncommon it says whenever a human we control dies we get to draw a card and whenever a creature we control with a plus one plus one counter on it dies, we gain two life. So I should like this card because it draws cards. Problem is, it doesn't necessarily do much the turn we play it. And once it's in play, the opponent can somewhat play around it a little bit. Yeah, this seems just a little slow, clunky, conditional, you name it. Uh, enough things that make me not very interested in late to rest unfortunately so i'll give this a d massive might a one mana instant giving target creature plus two plus two and trample until end of turn so a fine pump spell can use it like pre-combat to maybe help you with training so you've got a creature large enough to enable your training creatures but uh yeah having trample definitely a relevant ability if you're combining it with some large green creatures like the 6-6 six, six we saw earlier for instance so fine combo trick probably still just a c moldcraft millipede is five mana for a 2-2 insect horror at common when it enters the battlefield mill three cards and then put a plus one plus one counter on millipede for each creature card in our graveyard so now we're starting to see some payoff cards for milling ourselves although it's just like a 5 mana big vanilla creature at the end of the day with no special abilities. So what's like a realistic amount of creatures to have in our graveyard? If our deck has 17 lands, maybe 15 or a couple more creatures, then we can maybe expect to get like two counters if we're lucky with just a millipede. So we definitely need more ways to mill ourselves for the millipede to be good because by itself it's uh, not worth it. But uh, yeah, maybe an incentive for the blue-green self-mill deck. And uh, pretty funny that the Millipede builds itself indeed. So I'll give Millipede a C. Definitely a build-around card. Mulch is back, and this is one of the better ways to fill our graveyard. Two mana sorcery at common reveals the top four cards of our library putting all land cards revealed this way into our hand and the rest into our graveyard, leaving those creatures in our graveyard to grow the millipede. So mulch seems like a pretty important enabler for the self-mill archetype and gets a C+. We'll usually find at least one land and hopefully more. Next is Nature's Embrace. Three mana enchantment aura at common can enchant a creature or land. It's a pretty unique new kind of effect that uh, we haven't really seen before. As long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets plus two plus two. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a land, we can tap it to add two mana of any one color. So early in the game, can use it for ramp. And if we top deck it late, we can at least still enchant one of our creatures, giving it plus two plus two. So a very 
nice design, I feel, but uh, still not a card I'm thrilled to play necessarily. Feels like uh, both halves are a little bit underwhelming, so I'm still gonna give it a D, but I definitely like the card. Next is the Oakshade Stalker. Three mana for a 3 3 human, a ranger, werewolf, and uncommon. That's the daybound side. And we can cast the spell with flash if we pay two additional mana. Although five mana for a 3 3 reach is a little bit pricey. And we can still play the ambusher at instant speed because it will just enter the battlefield as a 6 3. But of course, we're still casting the uh, stalker for the front half. So yeah, it can be a five mana 6 3 with flash. Although a 6-3 isn't necessarily a great blocker, so it's more of a, a surprise attacker on the following turn. So yeah, seems okay, but we're probably mostly going to just play this as a 3-3 three, three, for 3, and then it has some random upside on top of it. So it's not like it needs all these extra abilities to be playable, but uh, yeah, gets a C+. Plus. Next is the Pack Song Pup, 2 mana for a 1 1 wolf add on common. And at the beginning of combat on our turn, if we control another wolf or werewolf, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the pup. And when it dies, we gain life equal to its power. So, not too difficult to keep growing the pup. A bit reminiscent of the beetle from Theros, which was quite strong. This one starts out as a 1 1 instead of a 2 2. But in a red-green werewolf deck, it shouldn't be too difficult to uh, enable it. So it can maybe start growing on turn 3, as opposed to needing a 4-powered creature, which is usually on turn 4 onwards. So it can certainly catch up to the beetle in size pretty quickly. So yeah, I like the pack song pup. Gets a C+, will be amazing for the red-green werewolf deck, where it might even sneak its way into the B range. Then we've got a Reclusive Taxidermist, 2 mana for a 1-2 Human Druid at Uncommon. It gets plus 3 plus 2 as long as there are 4 or more creature cards in your graveyard. So this goes into the blue-green self-mill deck, where it can easily be a 2 mana 4-4 four, four late in the game. And in the meantime, it can still tap to add 1 mana of any color. So it does a good job of ramping into all sorts of expensive cards. So we'll go with a B for Reclusive Taxidermist. Just two mana ramp creatures already okay, but just having that additional upside, I think, might uh, sneak it into the B range instead. Next we have Retrieve, a three mana sorcery add on common, returning up to one target creature card and up to one target non-creature permanent from our graveyard to our hand. And then we exile Retrieve. So doesn't seem as good as, let's say, the Dryad's Revival from Midnight Hunt. Doesn't have flashback, and we have to be able to return two cards at once, which is not always going to be trivial. There's not that many non-creature permanents other than lands, so seems like a maybe playable card in a blue-green self-mill deck, but still not particularly exciting, so C for Retrieve. Then we've got Rural Recruit, 4 mana, 1-1 one, one Human Peasant at common, with training. And when the Recruit enters a battlefield, create a 3-1 Green Boar Creature Token. So the token, perfect for growing the Recruit. First time you attack with both, we get a 2-2 two, two and a 3-1. And if we can repeat that, we can maybe get up to a 3-3. Three, three. So perfect at enabling itself. Split across two bodies, so even if they kill the... 3-1 boar will at least still have the 1-1 one, one recruit, which can grow over time. C plus seems like a pretty solid common. Next up is Sawblade Slinger, 4 mana for a 4-3 human archer at uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, we get to choose up to one mode between destroying an artifact an opponent controls or fighting a zombie an opponent controls. So 4-3 is okay at fighting. Not amazing, so it can maybe fight like a 2-2 or a 2-3 zombie and live to tell the tale. But it's gonna struggle against uh, bigger zombies. Destroying an artifact, definitely relevant with blood tokens in the format, so just a, a nice little bit of upside. 4 mana for a 4-3 is okay stats, not amazing. 
so we're definitely paying for the ability, which is okay, but killing a zombie is not going to happen very often, I feel. So overall, the Sawblade Slinger's good, but not amazing. I think I'm just giving it a C instead of a C+. Sheltering Bows is a 3-mana enchantment aura at common, enters a battlefield and draws a card, enchanting a creature, giving it plus 1, plus 3. So without drawing a card, of course, would not be particularly playable, but the fact that it replaces itself makes it a lot more interesting. You just have to be careful that your creature doesn't get removed at instant speed, and then you're good to go. And plus 1, plus 3... Decent stats, especially for like a black green toughness matter decks, then uh, the three additional toughness could actually translate into three additional damage every turn and uh, can also help grow your creature for training purposes. So I think uh, Bows is actually playable, but still probably not more than a C grade. A Snarling Wolf is back as well. Not sure why, but I guess it's a one-mana wolf for your red-green wolf tribal synergies. Wasn't particularly amazing the first time around, don't expect it to perform much better. So, gets a D. Then we've got the Spiked Ripsaw, three-mana artifact equipment at Uncommon, giving the equipped creature plus three plus three. Equip cost is pretty steep at three-mana, and when the equipped creature attacks, we may sacrifice a forest to give it trample until end of turn. So a bit of a strange card, not sure which archetype really wants access to this. I guess it's a way to increase power and toughness for like a green-white training deck. Trample could be useful on a large creature in like a blue-green self-mill deck. But the card's a little bit inefficient and it's not like we can sacrifice too many forests before we're out of it. It's certainly impactful giving a lot of extra power and toughness, gives you a good mana sink, but kind of slow and vulnerable to interaction as well. Splendid Reclamation is reprinted, the 4 mana rare sorcery, returning all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So all sorts of fun shenanigans you can do with this in a self mill deck, allowing you to ramp quite quickly, but uh, I don't think it's a card that's going to be all that great for limited, requires a lot of setup, and then you might not even have the ramp payoffs to make use of it, but maybe you can do something fun with it and construct it. Give this a D. Spore Crawler is uh, pretty creepy. A 3 mana, 3-2 three, fungus at common. When it dies, we get to draw a card. So not sure exactly what's going on in the art, but they probably don't want to know. Overall, the card's quite good, so probably one of the better commons in green gets a C+. Also pairs well with potential exploit cards in blue or black. Sporeback Wolf is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two wolf at common, and as long as it's our turn, it gets plus 0, plus 2. So perfect for the high toughness black-green deck, as well as potentially having some synergy in the red-green werewolf deck. So it has a bit of overlap there. And uh, yeah, a 2-2 two -two with slight upside, just a C. Toxic Scorpions, a 2-mana 1-1 one -one Scorpion at common with Death Touch, and when it enters a battlefield, another target creature we control gains Death Touch until end of turn. So yeah, fine early defensive creature. Want our Death Touch creatures to be nice and cheap so we can play them early, trade them off, and then the ETB effect is random upside. So, fine card but also nothing amazing necessarily, so C for Toxic Scorpion. Then we've got the Ulvenwald Oddity, a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four beast at rare, and it has Trample and Haste, so I'm getting uh, Questing Beast vibes from it. And at 7-mana we can transform the Oddity into the 8-8 eight, eight Ulvenwald Behemoth with still Trample and Haste, and other creatures we control also get plus 1 plus 1, Trample and Haste. So, yeah, this is a bomb. Easily gets an A. Good on turn 4. If the game stalls out, the behemoth is going to be hard to beat. Weaver of Blossoms is a 3-mana 2-3 human werewolf at common. Can tap to add 1 mana of any color. 
So nice bit of ramp and then transforms into Blossom Clad Werewolf, a 3-4 that can tap to add two mana of any one color instead. So that's a significant amount of ramp and some decent power and toughness to boot. So yeah, quite a lot to like about this one. Give it a C plus. Witch's Web is a two mana instant at common, giving target creature plus three plus three and reach, and we also get to untap it. So quite decent in terms of a comma trick. Will help against flying creatures, can kind of be a surprise ambush. And uh, yeah, overall relatively decent rate. So gets a C as far as pump spells go. This is a good one. Then Wolf Strike, three mana instant at common. Target creature gets plus two plus zero oh until end of turn if it's night and then it deals damage equal to its power to target creature we don't control. So not as good as clear shot is going to be most of the time, but certainly has additional upside in a werewolf deck, and uh, 3 mana for an instant speed bite effect is still okay. So don't think I'm quite going up to the B range, but at the very least a C+, and it's probably going to be green's best removal spell at common. Wolfkin Outcast is a 6 mana, 5 4 human werewolf and uncommon. Costs 2 generic mana less to cast if we control a wolf or a werewolf, which should not be too difficult in uh, green, especially red green. And this is a daybound side, and then when it turns to night, we get a Wedding Crasher, a 6 5 werewolf. And whenever a Crasher or another wolf or werewolf we control dies, we get to draw a card. So, very powerful ability in a dedicated werewolf deck gets a B. First artifact is Blood Servitor, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two construct at common. When it enters the battlefield, it creates a blood token. So nothing special, but it's a curve filler if we need a 3-drop. So gonna be slightly better in like a red-black vampire deck where we care about having blood tokens and sacrificing blood tokens. But usually not a card you want to play if you've got better 3s. So, gets a D. A boarded Window. This one is one of the cards that I was less sure about its rating. 3 mana artifact at uncommon. Creatures attacking us get minus 1 minus 0. And at the beginning of each end step, if we were dealt 4 or more damage this turn, we have to exile Boarded Window. So the effect of giving opposing creatures minus 1 minus 0 is certainly impactful. It's going to make it more difficult for the opponent to deal 4 damage to us than otherwise. But uh, it still seems a little bit too easy for the opponent to remove Boarded Window. Um, this is a card that we probably don't want to play on turn 3. Because then we're not progressing our own board, which makes it easier for the opponent to deal that uh, 4 damage and remove it. So this is kind of a card you want to play when the board is close to a board stall, and with the additional minus one minus O, oh, it's going to make it even more difficult for the opponent to uh, kind of break it. But uh, yeah, it's going to feel very bad once they do manage to get in and uh, remove the boarded window, because then all of a sudden the floodgates are open and you're going to fall behind very quickly. Not confident about this rating, but I think I'm going to start out with a D and uh I could easily see some decks that are good at protecting themselves, maybe like a black-green high toughness deck where you've got some good defense, where the additional minus one minus O is useful for dealing with tokens or flyers that might otherwise deal additional damage. Ceremonial Knife is a one mana equipment, equips for two mana, giving plus one plus O, and whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage, we create a blood token. So, it doesn't say that the creature needs to deal comma damage to the opponent, which is certainly relevant. So, it's not too difficult to make a couple blood tokens with it. Now, with that being said, 1 mana to play and then 2 mana to equip is pretty steep for only a plus 1 plus 0 bonus. Could see maybe playing one of these in a very dedicated red-black aggressive vampire deck but I'm still not uh, thrilled about it, so I'll give it a D. Dollhouse of Horrors is an interesting one, a 5-mana rare artifact. 
For one mana we can tap it and exile a creature card from our graveyard. And then we create a token that's a copy of the exiled card, except it's a 0-0 construct artifact in addition to its other types, and it gets plus one plus one for each construct we control. So if it's the first construct, it's just going to be a 1-1, one, one, but still has all those abilities of the exiled creature. And it also gains haste until end of turn, can only use it as a sorcery. So we're slowly going to build up our dollhouse, and all the constructs are going to keep getting bigger and bigger. So it will eventually generate a very large army of creatures. It's just a little bit slow to get going, so we'll be probably at its best in a blue-green self-mill deck that has a bit of ramp to make it easier to play the dollhouse and later enable it. But yeah, seems like a fun card, even though it's a little bit slow. I'll give it a C. Foreboding Statue, 3 mana, 1-2 Construct, Artifact Creature at Uncommon. Can tap to add 1 mana of any color, and then we put an Omen Counter on the statue, and at the beginning of our end step, if there are 3 or more Omen Counters on it, we untap it and then transform it. The fact that we untap it is very relevant, means that we'll have, once it transforms, the 5-5 five five Forsaken Thresher on defense, and at the beginning of our pre-combat main phase, we add 1 mana of any color. So we still get a bit of ramp, fixes our mana, and uh, yeah, a 3 mana creature that eventually turns into a 5-5 five five after 3 activations. Gives us a nice board presence while still ramping and fixing our mana. So not much more you can ask out of a 3-drop, so gets a C+. Honored Heirloom is a 3 mana artifact and it taps to add one mana of any color, so a nice bit of mana fixing for those three plus color decks. And for two mana we can also tap it to exile target card from a graveyard, as if there weren't enough graveyard hate already. So yeah, heirloom's fine if we need a three mana ramp effect, this will do. Just don't know how many decks are gonna really need this effect. Gets a C. Then Investigator's Journal is a 2-mana rare artifact clue, so it has that clue subtype. When it enters a battlefield, it enters with a number of suspect counters on it, equal to the greatest number of creatures any player controls. So that could be the opponent, could be us. And then for 2-mana we can tap it, remove a suspect counter from it, and draw a card. So let's say the opponent has three or four creatures, or we control three or four creatures, we play this, and then we can start drawing cards right away. Although it's going to be four mana essentially for the first card, which is pretty steep. And then at some point we can also pay two mana, sack the journal itself to draw a card. So provides an additional card on top of all those suspect counters. So it's very slow card draw, but in a deck that's good at stalling out the game and presumably has lots of creatures itself, it's going to be a nice way to kind of refuel and uh, probably at its best in a deck that can also develop its mana with maybe green ramp creatures. So once again, probably okay in blue-green. So a slow card draw spell, but it is powerful if you can uh, activate it a few times. Gets a C. And then Lantern of the Lost is a one mana Graveyard Hate Artifact at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, exile target card from a graveyard, and for one mana we can tap and exile the Lantern to exile all cards from all graveyards, and then we draw a card. So pretty similar to cards like maybe Relic of Progenitus or the uh, Lantern from the recent set. That being said, I don't know if we really need to main deck this. Like, sure, there are some disturbed cards out there, but uh, do I really want to play a Lantern of the Lost in the main deck? Feels like more of a sideboard card against the more dedicated graveyard decks instead. So, yeah, I don't feel like I need to main deck this, so I'll give it a D. It's also symmetrical when using the activated ability, so we'll exile our graveyard as well, which could potentially be a drawback. Then we have Wedding Invitation, 2-mana artifact at common, when it enters a battlefield, a draw card, so replaces itself, and then we can tap and sacrifice it, and then target creature cannot be blocked this turn, and if it also happens to be a vampire, it gains lifelink until end of turn. 
So if we don't have many 2-drops, we can just add this to our deck as a 2-mana cantrip that has a bit of utility late game. Uh, plays well with the blue cant that draws a card when it hits the opponent. That's a cool combo. And of course in a vampire deck we'll get even better thanks to lifelink. Yeah, invitation seems playable. I'll give it a C. And then we get to the lands. We've got a new cycle of dual lands, continuing the cycle started in Midnight Hunt. So Deathcap Glade, Dreamroot Cascade. I'll skip over Evolving Wilds for a second. Shattered Sanctum, Stormcarved Coast, and Sundown Pass. All of these I'll collectively give a C+. Fine mana fixing. Happy to have them if I'm playing those colors, but uh, not necessarily going to prioritize them. And then Evolving Wilds also gets a C plus grade. Nice mana fixing. It's a land that can go to our graveyard where it can potentially synergize with additional cards that care about having lands in our graveyard. Think of the Cemetery Cycle, for instance. And uh, yeah, just a good mana fixing to have. Even in a two color deck, I'm happy to have the first two copies of Evolving Wilds typically. And. Last but not least, there's Voldaren Estate, a rare vampire land, taps for colorless, or we can tap it, pay one life, and add one mana of any color, but we can only spend it to cast vampire spells. So pretty narrow, um, maybe it's good enough in a red-black vampire deck, but even there it's somewhat questionable. And the real payoff is, for five mana, we can tap it to create a blood token, and it costs one less to activate for each vampire we control. So, a reasonable mana sink, although having to play this in your mana base means it's going to make it difficult to cast some of your non-creature spells, since it uh, only makes colorless mana for those. And then late game, it can maybe make a few blood tokens, which is useful for some of your synergies, but um, I kind of doubt that it's necessarily worth it to make your mana base worse for it. Gonna give it a D. And yeah, that wraps up the entire set review. Once again, I want to remind you that if you're a Twitch subscriber or supporter on Patreon, you can get access to the full spreadsheet that will be available on Discord as well. So if you're there, you'll be able to see the spreadsheet that's already available, and I'll keep it up to date as I play the set more and update the card ratings. And uh, yeah, we'll be back soon with some uh, Crimson Vow draft and sealed, hopefully. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, that's going to be it for me today. I want to thank everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel. And you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.